Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. My name is Dave Scott, sitting in SOR headquarters tonight. Thank you for joining us. Grant Baker is our guest. You may have seen him in our chat room a number of times, and he's here to tell his incredible encounters with Sasquatch, UFOs, paranormal, and extraterrestrials. But first, let's bring in the roll call. We got Mike L. in the gold medal position. Grant Tavy has taken home the silver. Mennonite Abe with a nice bronze medal tonight. Cloudy with a chance of UFO. It's good to see you, race fan. I owe you an apology. I was training Thin Lizzy on StreamYard tonight, and that's why we ended up setting it up early. So I apologize. Breaking your streak, that's my fault. My fault. Start a new one tomorrow, man. Hey, stunning cosmic floor, luscious jewels. Nice to see you. Jeffrey DeRuin, Todd Purden, Downshift, Acreon. How you guys doing, man? Thank you all for coming on in. And there is stunning Steph Dickey. John Swan, Mama Susan, the gong show is here. He'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Ross Lambda, Grant Tavius, good to have you guys here. Mr. Man Mister is here as well. He'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the right of the studio, to the right. Ross Lambda, Nightmare, Double Tim, good to have you all here. Thank you for joining us. Smithy, thank you for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis, so thank you so much. Stunning Samantha Hazelwood Gray, Mr. Lurks a lot. How you doing? 5900 buck. Good to see you back. Ed Clater is here, everyone. The Ed Clater. Let's move on. Digger Dog, Roy the Boy. Good to see you guys here. Thanks for coming on in. There's our man, Belenium. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby. Yes, aren't we impressed? I am. The gorgeous fidgety aura has returned. The Doug Shelby again. And again, the Doug Shelby. I, I just love saying it. It's fun. I know you're laughing. I can feel you, man. Richard Elmore, Kevin, TMI, OB Flett, my man, Bigfoot, Michigan, Rob. Great show with Tex. I got to have you guys on in March. So uh, talk to Tex and see when you guys are available. Let's line it up on the schedule, Rob, if you don't mind. And B, Connor from Bigfoot Anonymous. How you guys doing? Lovely Lauren looking gorgeous tonight. And uh, who else do we have here? Oh, well, let's see. We'll scroll on down. And uh, Steve Wolf, good to have you here. Oh, there's Carol Indy. Hello, Carol Indy. Fapster, what's going on? Film Intervino from Ontario. We love you, man. How you doing? Parts unknown, weight unknown. The mask president is here. Scott Brown, ITF. How you doing, man? Good to see you back. It's been a while. Michael Fontaine. Boom. Gorgeous Bama. Hey, there's Uncle Dale and his power stash. If you're in Austin, Texas, and you see Uncle Dale, rub his power stash for good luck right through tax time. Sensational Sherry. Super Quest. How you doing, buddy? Give me one second here. We're going to start the radio sign. <coughs> excuse me and who else do we have here oh well there's simon condon how are you horror realm how you been doing man gorgeous kathy evans nice to see you and there's the lovely jenny and who else is here oh there's oh there's our man there's our man it's hallmark Corey has a hot cocoa already watching the hallmark channel on one side and me on the other 
How you doing, bud? Does your girlfriend yet know that you're addicted to the Hallmark Channel? Please let me know. Rich Hilke is here. The gorgeous Diesel Girl. How you doing? And uh, Horror Realm, thank you so much for the super chat, man. I really do appreciate that. It's a great way to support what we do, and you always do that, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Uh, who else? The gorgeous Dirt Road. Can we get it all in? Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you. Oob to Joe's Maine. You've got small feet as well. Taking my line, Jeff Steve Garvey. He'll hit a home run for you. Noble Patrick, good to have you here. Julio, how's it going, man? Penman, what's going on? Hey, Super Chat is open. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. And most importantly, horns up. Time to rock. mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is space now radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old baby the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio, Instagram at spaced out radio show, and on TikTok at spaced out radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a great show for you tonight because I love experiencers. I love their stories, these true firsthand accounts of what real people are going through. That's what we're getting from Grant Baker tonight. Literally, he's got aliens and he's got Bigfoot. Hour three, we're going to the swamp. Another story from Swamp Dweller. Super Duke is back. For the cryptid report, Shirky Poo's got the news, and we'll try and squeeze in the thought of the day. Throughout his life, Grant Baker has been fascinated by the unexplained. From ancient civilizations, megalithic structures on this planet, as well as other planets, to sentient life in the cosmos. His own experiences with the paranormal started at the young age of five, with a late-night encounter with a gray. This was followed a few years later by a chance meeting with Bigfoot as an adolescent, and then with paranormal activity in his own home as a teen. As an adult, he has witnessed multiple instances of strange happenings in the sky. How does that sound for all of you tonight? To me, it sounds like we got to roll that woo train. Yes, it does. Grant Baker, welcome to Spaced Out Radio for the first time. How are you? Thanks, Dave. I'm doing great. How are you doing tonight? I am fantastic. And you know, the one thing that I love, my friend, is you may not be the biggest name in the community, but your story is yours. It's real. And you're one of the people who has decided to get out there and tell your story, not for your own education, but to maybe help somebody else who's had the same experiences as you. And you can maybe correlate with each other and, and share the instances of what's gone, gone on in your lives, man. That's a big thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's one of those things where the more people we talk to these days, everybody has their own experiences. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I can share mine and I would really love to hear other people's as well. I mean, I'm, I'm so super into it. You know, I, 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 of course, have a daytime job. And during my nighttime, when it's just me by myself or even with my family, it's all I do is I listen to you. I listen to other podcasts. I'm digging into YouTube. I'm digging online and, and just trying to get as much information as I can because it's time. We we are in the time to, to really experience this stuff. I got to ask you, if you're much like me, that when you're searching YouTube, television, Google, other types of, of information sites, do you end up getting frustrated because nothing seems to be exactly what you have experienced? 
I know that when I started my own trek before I started this show, that was my biggest frustration. Like when I saw the black triangles, everybody's had the three lights on the corner. Mine was lit up all over. Mm -hmm. You know, like why did mine have to be different than everyone else's? Did you go through that frustration? I do actually. And uh, in, in fact, when we get into the Bigfoot conversation, my Bigfoot story, and I was within 30 feet of the guy, is completely different than everybody else I've ever even heard of. There's a place over here in town or in actually the town I used to live in and it's dedicated nothing to nothing but Bigfoot. And every single story that I've ever read within that, and that's just that sighting, you know, sightings all over the, the Northwest, they're all different. Everybody's a different when it comes to UFOs, whether they're meeting some type of intelligent being, whether it's ethereal or an actual physical being, everybody's story is different. There's sometimes I'm coming across. In fact, what's funny is, is a, there's been a few instances recently within the last couple of months where I was watching your show and I get really excited when some of the experiences that you've had on have experienced the same thing I had. And I was just like, there it is. And it's, it's validation. And I think the more that everybody's talking to each other and then the more stories that people are starting to share, I think it's starting to validate everybody else as well. Cause all of us are just like you and me, we're having our own experiences. You see the triangle with lights. I've seen triangles without lights at all. And of course you just stated it. There's people that see triangles with the three dots. So yes. What's the biggest frustration for you being an experiencer? <laughs> That's actually pretty easy. And I, I'm sure you've run across this as well. Uh, the biggest frustration is it's telling your story. And what's really interesting is now these time and days, I mean, within the last five years, of course, 2017, um, it's been a lot easier to tell the story. The biggest frustration is you start saying something to somebody or somebody seen a light in the sky and you guys start sharing stories and there might be a whole bunch of other people around you. Oh, that's whatever. You guys are crazy. And nobody wants to listen to it, which is fine. You know, everybody has their own beliefs. And and there's going to become a day where it's not as frustrating to talk to people about it. It's it's going to be more relevant. A lot more people are going to be more accepting of it. And when that day comes, and you know, my frustrations will be gone. And I think another thing is, is one of the bigger frustrations is it's in the news. And I'm not going to get any kind of uh, political on you about it, but I mean, let's admit it's it's everywhere. Everybody knows about it. And still, you know, fortunately, people like you were talking about it, which is really great for all of us experiencers and people that want to experience it haven't yet. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing for me. And I love talking to experiencers. I, I, I cannot say that enough. The reason why is I think with all the experiencers, even though the experience may be different, there's a common bond there, especially with the ET crowd and the UFO crowd. The paranormal crowd, not so much. The cryptid crowd, I think you could put more towards the UFO type crowd. But I mean, the idea that you can sit with someone and have a conversation and know that you are actually understanding the feeling they're going through, the trauma they felt, the the misunderstanding, the, the PTSD, if we could call it that fairly, yeah. that goes along with the experiences. I, I think that there's just this common bond between people. Have you had conversations with a lot of experiencers over the years about what you've gone through? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, some of the experiences I have uh, many of my friends have been there with me and I'm still friends with them to this day. And it's, it's really nice to have that common, you know, not, I wasn't the only one and, and that makes it a lot easier, but yeah, absolutely. I have, um, a friend that just recently within the last few months, uh, over in, in another town that I was living in had an experience for the first time ever. And he saw it and he had his, his kids in the car and I can explain that in a little bit more detail later, but it's, and he, the first person he came to was me and he's just like, Hey, check this out. I seen this. And I was like, that is amazing. And, <laughs> and what's really funny is, is I was actually kind of jealous. I was like, Oh man, I was out that night too. How come I didn't see it? I would have loved to have been there with him, but yeah, it's, I love having the conversation with, you know, friends, family, of course, my whole family knows I'm, I'm just a junkie for this stuff. And, uh, and a lot of my old friends and new friends, you know, a lot of them are coming around where they're, they're just as interested in it. 
were you one of the many experiencers out there when the government admitted that there were UFOs flying around that they didn't know that you were pointing at your friends saying, aha, told you, told you, you called me nuts, you called me tinfoil, you called me conspiracy theorist, and look who's right, this guy. How many times did you get to do that? Oh, oh gosh! If I had my wife right here, to, <laughs> uh, she would she would be just glaring at me. And uh, that was actually I was here when that happened. I was at home, and immediately, you know, I, I just she's like, "What are you listening to?" And I started telling her, and I got the old, "Here we go again," you know. And and she's she's adorable. She she listens to it politely and and asks questions, so she's very tolerant of it. But. Uh, yeah, the moment, the moment that I heard it, I was all over it. I was like, I knew it. I told you. And and then, of course, any friend that I came across or anybody I could talk to for months after that, it was that's all I could talk about. It was great. I loved it. Did you feel satisfied by that report as an experiencer? I, you mean the report that just came out um, from and the government? In, yeah. Yes, I, I actually did. I it was it was. Um, it's kind of a 50 50 you know i i wasn't surprised with what came out or how little came out in that report and in fact the fact that it even exists is is just enough for me because when it comes to is the government gonna you know tell everybody what's going on i i really don't care if they do or not and uh just the fact that they've kind of admitted that everything's going on is validation enough for me uh, they they're aware of it. We're all aware of it. We're the ones that are actually reporting on it, just like you are every day, more than more so than they are. I mean, you can listen to the Lou Elizondos and the Chris Mellons and, and, and anybody out there, Grant Cameron and all that, which I I listen to every day. But it's us. We're the ones that are going to go ahead and and break this out of its shell, and with or without the government. I'm going to ask you a weird question here. Go ahead. All right, because I'm a firm believer that those of us who've had experiences can pick up on the energy of others who have had experiences. Absolutely. Uh, would you say that's correct? Absolutely. 100% correct. All right. All right. I'm one for one here. Now I'm going to see if I'm two for two. When okay. you look at Lou Elizondo, what do you see? Okay. It's a good question. It's a good question. And uh, in fact, I was just talking about one of my significant other I think last night about this and I, I listened to I listened to a lot of things the man says and, and and not only how he says it but the demeanor in which he which he does it in so he has you know he has this idea so he, he's he's not going to disclose anything that he, I mean he's a patriot the man is just he's he's get, he has morals and and I like that about him he's personable I've watched him on other podcasts where he was talking about cars and what he liked to eat in restaurants. And so he's a very personable guy. He's very articulate. And once you start getting him close to the questions that you know as well as I do, he's not gonna he's not gonna answer those. He gets very guarded. He, he keeps a lot close to the chest. And when he does that, it's kind of telling me like it's either one of two things. A I mean, I know he has respect for his NDA. He's not going to tell anybody anything. But the way he's guarded about it tells me that he's probably an experiencer. In one way, shape, or form, either he knows what's going on and, and has a lot of experience with it, or he's actually had that experience himself. I would agree with the latter. I would agree with the latter. I, I actually strongly believe... and. And I have no, no proof of this, but I bet you he's either been he's either been face to face with a craft, face to face with aliens, or he's been on craft while awake, like you and I. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's been knocked out. I don't know if it has to do with his position in the government. I don't know if it's happened to, that he's just an experiencer like you and I. All right, I don't know. But that is the gut feeling that I get that I cannot shake. And to have you pick up on the exact same thing, I, I, it just gives me more confirmation. Mm -hmm. More confirmation. I appreciate that. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. All right. Let's uh, start to focus. Oh, you want to say? Sorry. 
No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Well, let's start the conversation changing towards more of you here because tonight, you know, it's it's about your story. I mean, five years old, you have mm. a great encounter. You got to tell us a story. Yeah, that uh, that's actually an interesting time in my life. And you, you got to understand at five years old, I was born in 79 and I never knew what an alien was. I never knew what spaceships were. I didn't know what a gray was. I didn't even see one on a poster. None of that when I was five years old ever crossed me. I was about the Bernstein Bears and Looney Tunes on TV. I mean, that's that's all my life was about. And and I have a you know, I have a sibling. I have a younger sister. And every night her and I, you know, we'd go through all our routine and she's, you know, a couple years younger than I am and but we had the, we, at that time, you know, we shared the same room and everything was normal. Everything was absolutely normal. I didn't have any feelings. I just, everything was normal. My grandmother, who every night she would come in and, <laughs> and let us pick out books. Of course, we always took an exorbitant amount of time picking out our books because we didn't want to go to bed and we'd always pick four or five of them out. So it took her longer to read. And every night it was always the same. We'd be on my sister's bed and we had about, you know, a three or four foot space between both, both you know, beds. My grandmother would lay in the middle, my sister next to the window, me next to the aisle. And we would read books. And that's, and that's what we did every night for as long as I can remember until I grew up and, and got out of that. And this night was not unlike any other night. And in fact, what's interesting is I remember, and the reason why I said Bernstein Bears, because that was actually the book that we had read. And it was one of those golden books that everybody has. In fact, I, I still got some of them on the shelf over here. And she read through the books and everything was okay. And I decided, you know, because sometimes we'd get a little scared of the dark and I was going to go ahead and stay in my sister's bed with her. And so, okay, that's fine. My grandmother you know, tucks us in, kisses us goodnight and, and go ahead and leaves the room and shuts the light off. And I'm just sitting there awake and we had one solitary light across the street. And nowadays that light would bother me because I like to sleep in pitch black, but that light would illuminate the window. And there was a, and do you remember those pull down blinds? Not the Venetian ones that, that are curated, yeah, but the, the rolling ones. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if you, if you pull it down and let it go, you're in trouble. And uh, so we had one of those, but th th this night it was, it was up and we, we didn't close it. So I could have a clear view of kind of the little bit of the awning and, and the trees and the, and the nice guy. And I laid there and laid there and laid there and I, I was just going and going. And I don't know if, if you're the type of person that just has this feeling. And I felt like this, this weird, something's watching me feeling. And so I'm looking around and I didn't, I didn't notice anything right off the bat. And I, I said, well, this is weird. You know, so I'm trying to get comfortable and go to sleep. And something told me there's something here. There's, there's something here. And I'm kind of getting that frantic feeling. I'm, I'm five and I don't understand exactly how to deal with this. And I, I start looking over to the window and that's when I started seeing it. And I saw the movement first and this wasn't something that just appeared. This was slow. It was meticulous. And I watched pretty much in horror, this thing slowly, slowly move through this window and into my room. And by the time I'd actually started looking at the movement, I couldn't really tell if the window was open or closed. I, I, I just couldn't tell. And I watched the fingers and it's, I mean, it's just like a sci-fi movie. It's, probably, you know, like aliens or something like literally where they do the, the scene with the lights and the, the flickering and you see something just reach around a corner, grab it real slow and the music and everything, except for in this case, it was dark. The window was open. I'm watching this in complete silence and just mortified. I could not move. I was just watching this and it had grabbed the sill and I saw the hands and I, I want to say there was four fingers. I want to say there was four fingers and it started pulling itself in. And when I seen it, it was literally like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my eyes of what I was looking at. And so when I see pictures of grace today, this one 
literally was not a nice looking creature. Uh, it, it had a normal triangulated head and, and, you know, bulbous head. It had the classic, you know, the, the almond eyes, the big black almond eyes. And it did have two little holes for a nostril. It did have a mouth. Uh, it actually looked like it was sneering at me while it was watching me. I didn't see any hair and the way it was backlit, the, the, behind it, I could see it was kind of wrinkly and, and not smooth. I've heard a lot of people say they're smooth. This one was not smooth at all. This was had a lot of wrinkles around its head, neck, and, and a lot on its hands, actually, which I did remember. And it did have uh, fingernails, which is something that I thought was interesting later on in life once I looked back on it. So it's staring at me. And all it was projecting or how I was feeling was this thing was not nice. It was not friendly. It was not there to help me out. It was not there to read me another Bernstein Bears book. And it started moving. It came further into the room. I, by this time, I could see its neck, its shoulders, and that's as far down the body as I could see. I didn't see anything else past that. But its arms were strangely longer than I thought they should be. And it started reaching for me through the window. And it would stare at me. I mean, it was literally locking eye contact with me the whole time. And it just had this like a grumpy old man stare at me. It just did not relinquish its stare at me at all. And it finally reached all the way down to where it was almost touching me. And when that happened, I screamed. And when I screamed, it went dark. Everything went dark. It was like I had blinked. And... I, I even felt a difference with my body. So laying there just mortified and completely frozen because I couldn't move. I was scared out of my wits. All of a sudden, the feeling like everything was different. My back got cold and I was laying down in a different position and I opened my eyes. It's like I woke up and I was still screaming. It, I could hear myself. It never stopped all the way through this motion. When I opened my eyes, I had looked around and I, I was sitting straight up in bed by this point and I wasn't in my sister's bed anymore. And I looked over because, and I'm still freaking out. The window was completely shut, which I know for a fact it was opened when I had closed my eyes and the, the draw down shade was shut. It was completely dark. I couldn't see the light coming in from the street. My sister was asleep in her bed and now I was in my own bed six feet away and obviously screaming in the middle of the night is going to wake everybody up. And at five years old, I had a pretty good set of lungs on me. My grandmother come bursting into the room, trying to figure out what's going on like any normal parent would. And I was freaking, I was freaking out. And she called me down and said, what happened? And I said, I seen something. I seen something come through the window and she's, Oh, you're just having a bad dream. I've never had another dream. To this day, I have a lot of vivid dreams, and I'm sure everybody else has too, but I have never had a, a dream as vivid and as memorable as that. And I am 42 years old now, and I can still remember the feeling of the sheets that were cold on my back because I hadn't been laying in that bed previous. And there's there's not a day that goes by that when people say, oh, have you ever seen one? And for the years, I was like, no, not really. And then... Everybody starts talking. We have all these people, all these exper experiences that are uh, coming out with their stories. And the more I listen to it, the more I listen to all the other podcasts that I listen to. I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We're yeah. going to go to commercial break here at the bottom of the hour. Wow. We're going to continue this story with Grant Baker. Was he taken? Did he miss time? If his bed was cold? We're going to ask him all of these questions. When we return on Spaced Out Radio, I don't know about you, but I have goosebumps all over my body. It's the real deal. Real stories, real adventures, real experiences. Grant Baker on Spaced Out Radio next. All right, we're clear. I don't want to talk anything about this until we come back. You got it. Talk about it. anything else, but uh, <clears throat> but that holy shit. 
Holy yeah. shit. Oh, dude. I Now it makes sense for the yelling. Uh, d- shut up, Dave. Shut up. You weren't supposed Wait, to talk about it. <laughs> I, uh, wow. Yeah, what's, you know what's what? really... It, go ahead. It reminds me... I'm not going to mention this one on the air, but it reminds me about three years ago, I was dead asleep in my bed my partner had fallen asleep on the couch mm-hmm. and my little guy was in his room and you know when you wake up and you just know they're there oh yeah but you can't but you can't see them mm-hmm. we have this uh this blue uh night light but it's not like a night light it's like a like a neon board that plugs in and then when something walks by it, it, it changes, it goes lighter. Yes. And then when something, when it, when it dims down again, it'll dim da- down. And everything in my power, I was like, they're here. They're in the house. My dogs aren't moving and I'm lying in my bed alone. And I, and I was looking down the hallway and I could swear that I could see movement down the hallway. And the man in me is like, get up. Your your partner's over there. Your son is over there. But the chicken shit in me was like, you stay right here, buddy. You stay yeah. right yeah. here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Happens to me all yeah. the time. I did not move, man. I did not move. And it took me forever to fall back asleep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. I I, hi, Jose. Uh, who else has jumped in here? Manuel, how you doing, buddy? Gnome Squatch, good to see you. Paul Vidal, nice to have you back. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, you're good. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say the. Um, have you you got a guitar in the background? I'm gonna tell a story about this here in a minute. So I'm just gonna. Have you ever had one mess with anything else that you could audibly hear? No. Uh, you just wait. I got, All I, right. got two, I got I got two of them. In fact, uh, I have a I have a good friend. I'll tell the whole story, but I got a good friend. Yeah, that that really yeah it mm-hmm. is fun. And uh, yeah, that one's a good one. Probably the scariest thing in this house where my studio is that happened was in 2018, where I heard a spirit. I was on the phone with one of my one of my SOR people at that time. And you know when kids scream, you know, they kind of do that laughing high-pitched scream that toddlers do? So I'm downstairs walking out of my studio to go back into the hallway to make my way upstairs. And I'm about to open the door, and I hear this scream laughter. And I said to the person on the phone, I said, did you hear that? And she goes, yeah. Yeah. I said, and she goes, was that your boy? And I said, sounded like him, didn't it? And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, there's a problem. He's at daycare in town. There's oh. no one home but me. <clears throat> yeah, that one got me. That one got me big time. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the of the the audible when they when they start making no. noises. I'm, I've never been a fan of that one. No. Hi, Kevin. Manitoba Becky, they call her the Wheat Queen. How you doing? We'll even put you up there. There you go. There you go, Wheat Queen. Nice to see you back. You're always so busy for us these days. Chris Mo in Australia, JKGN. How you doing? And who else has joined us? Apollo 11, good to see you. Uh, Hallmark Corey will be starring in the latest Hallmark Sasquatch tale. Loving with Sasquatch, a fireside story, it's called, will appear on the Hallmark Channel with Hallmark Corey from Wibs. Yep, I know how you do it. I do. Latro, how you doing, buddy? Uh, By the way, Hallmark Corey will be in Vegas for our Vegas party. Yes, he will. Greg.com, what's happening in Thailand, man? Hey, I want to say a big thank you to Smithy and Horror Realm for the great Super Chats. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so much. Reminder, UFOCon 2022, 
UFOCon.com is the website. Lynn Wallington and I will be speaking at UFOCon in San Francisco, March 25th to 27th. Don't forget the Vegas trip, April 22nd to 24th at the Golden Nugget Casino in Las Vegas. We want you there. Here we go. Second half hour is underway here on Space Out Radio. Good to have you listening in. My name is Dave Scott. Appreciate you tuning us in wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Now, I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you got our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do us the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Experiencer Grant Baker is here. And if you miss the first half hour, you're going to get goosebumps when you get to the bottom right before the break where he starts talking about being five years old and watching an alien reach through the window and try and grab him. The interesting part about it is his scream he kept on hearing. For him, it was a split second. But when he got back in bed, his sheets were cold. Where'd you go, Grant? That'd be a question I'd like to know. Uh, For well over 35, well, about 32 years, I didn't think I went anywhere. I thought it was just a dream. One of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. And, uh, you know, from all the the new people in the podcast that are coming out now and and actually all of us being able to have long form conversation conversations like this i started realizing some i said you know that might not have been a dream and i started listening to other experiencers stories and they're just they have missing time or something happens and all of a sudden everything's different from where they're at some people are in their car and they're all of a sudden home with me, I only moved six feet from one position to another, and I was actually in a different bed. I have no idea where I went. I, I don't know if I actually went anywhere. I Maybe they just said, oh, this kid's uh, probably not going to cooperate with us. Let's just go ahead and calm him down real quick, which obviously I didn't calm down. I would I toyed with the idea of actually getting regressed and going down and, and having some type of professional bring me back to that moment and maybe I can figure out exactly what happened. Uh, but ever since then, I don't know if they, they didn't implant anything into me. I don't have any weird things in my body. I've had enough x-rays to know that. But uh, every time I, I know, I have that, since from that point on, I've always known, look up, it, something's going on. I've never had the draw to just go outside and look up. I've never had anybody say in my ear, hey, you need to come out here and do that. I know a lot of a lot of experiencers have a lot of experiencers have that, but with mine is is usually I'm I just happen to be in the right spot at the right time, and then I get that feeling they're here, look up, or they're here, look over there, and then uh, there's other times where I get that feeling and they want me to know that they're there and I can see them right next to me, and that that's one that I'm not too fond of to be honest with you when they do that. In fact, I was commenting on another uh, episode or uh, one of these shows that you had not too long back a couple of weeks ago and a gentleman was on there talking about it and I'd asked him hey what are these what am I seeing and sure enough he said that's just another form of the grace and I believe him and I, I 100% believe it and I'm not the only one in my household that experiences that it's my wife experiences it as well oh wow what a gift to give her for a wedding present you got aliens honey you got aliens <laughs> Uh, wow. she's, she's had those for longer than she's known me, thank goodness. So I'm not the culprit on that one. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you know what? I'm very curious to go back to this session for a second because mm-hmm. you're, you're screaming as a five-year-old. Mm-hmm. You, you think you're back in your own bed. You don't know how you got there. You don't know how the window closed and the big uh, window shade got rolled down. One of them, you know, 800-pounders that they felt mm-hmm. like as kids. And yet, 
I'm still enthralled by the fact that you saw this thing, you started screaming, you started screaming in your, you're hearing it in your head that you were screaming. And then the next thing you know, you're back in bed with cold sheets and you don't know how you got there. When grandma runs in is now telling you, you just had a bad dream and it's just a nightmare, shake it off, be a big boy. You know, how did you react after all of that? I actually remember once she came in and told me it was a dream was, and now that you actually reiterated that to me, I, I just realized something that I never actually thought of before. How come she didn't notice that I wasn't in my sister's bed and that everything was different in the room. And, and uh, that got, that just got me thinking, it's like, how did she not know that? But for her to sit there and tell me it was a dream, you know, I, I trusted that woman and I, I loved her dearly. And, and I, I just, okay, it's a dream. And I just laid right back down and I thought about it for a little bit. I remember struggling with it. She ended up leaving the door open for us, which was very nice of her. And we did have one of those little incandescent uh, seashell lights out in the hallway. And uh, that shines enough light in the room that it calmed me down and I was able to go back to sleep. And I really, the next day, which, which was really interesting, I didn't think about it. In fact, I didn't think about that for a long time, right after it happened for, for you know a couple of years. And then when I started really started thinking about it, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I kind of saw something and, and I'm having all these other strange things happen to me ever since that moment. And then all the other strange things that started happening at night, I just thought it was my imagination. I was scared of the dark, but after a while it became apparent that it was not my imagination anymore. Well, you know what? You have another story about your guitars. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I, I got to hear this. Okay, so actually, it's good timing on your part with this one. So this is all the way up until I was. This stretches from the time that this happened, maybe about seven years old. So a couple years after the alien incident, the gray incident, from that point all the way up until I was 21. I, I had had paranormal, paranormal activity happening inside the house. And it, and it wasn't just one house, it was it would follow us. And in fact, it was happening enough that my grandmother uh, uh, started realizing it, that something was going on. Uh, my grandfather, unfortunately, he knew things were going on, but he just didn't want to, he just didn't want to believe in it or not, not believe in it, but it took him to a place he didn't like, so he just didn't want to talk about it. I would have doors open. I would have noises out in the living room, hallway, you would hear clinging of silverware in, a, in the silverware tray out in the kitchen. Nobody's awake. I am, but nobody else is. And by this point, I'm so frightened about certain things in the house because I'm scared of, uh, to this day, I'm scared of the unknown. I, I don't like it when I don't know what's going on. And one night, I am laying there in bed, and I mean to tell you, I, I'm, I'm trying to go to sleep, and the darkness is just overbearing out in the hallway and I can feel whatever's there. And in certain cases I can feel like a, a malevolent kind of feeling or the opposite. And this time it was more of a nice feeling, but I, I was still scared, but it was like, okay, everything's fine. And this is the day when I decided, or actually fast forward about three weeks, I told my grandparents I, I wanted a guitar for Christmas. And so I'm 15 years old and my grandparents, well, it, it might just be a, a phase. It's a long phase. And, uh, well, they ended up getting me one. And I was horrible at it. All night long I played on that thing. And they were so sweet in getting it to me. And they, they surprised me and everything. And I just, I just cleaned this thing top to bottom. It was absolutely beautiful. In fact, it was a Yamaha, kind of like this one right here. And... I put it in its case and I wanted it just perfect. I put it in the, in the closet and, and started getting ready for bed and nothing was weird was going on at that moment. I lay down in my bed and about, you know, it always took me a long time to go to sleep. So about an hour later, I'm, I'm getting that feeling like something's there. I don't know what it is. And I, and it was odd was the things that I would see was the hallway to always go pitch black, which I have another story about that as well. I don't know why things go pitch black. And that tells me it's kind of a, a cue that something's going on, something's there. 
in this case, it didn't come into my room. The, the blackness didn't come in there. I had multiple nightlights in my room at the time as well. And I just closed my eyes. I'm like, okay, I, I, it's going to be fine. If they don't come in here, they're not going to bother you. And then I heard it. I don't know if you've ever had anything that actually gives you chills and to the point where you get the goosebumps so bad that your skin hurts. When I heard this noise, I, I was actually more worried about the noise itself and where it was coming from than my own safety at the time. I heard all six strings on my guitar strung, like someone just ran their finger straight across it. And because of the way the case is built, it wasn't one of those nice fuzzy inside. It was just one of those cheaper cardboard cases for a guitar, an acoustic guitar. I jumped out of bed so fast because immediately I wasn't thinking about the darkness in the hallway. I was thinking, is there a mouse in my guitar? I literally thought that. And you know, being 15, reason out the window. And I jumped up and grabbed that case and just flew it open as fast as I could. And that guitar was still ringing from all six strings being strummed. And at that point, I realized, okay, it's messing with me. And I, I don't think he was really messing with me. Over time, I, I got kind of enamored by this happening, and I named the entity George, as, as most kids would call most animals or any kind of things that they see. But anyways, George uh, would do certain things like that. And strumming my guitar in the middle of the night, maybe he just wanted to play it as much as I did. You think that was a ghost or an ET? That I don't know. I used I used to call it a ghost. Um, I I think I could probably still say it is a ghost. I, I have a hard time believing in ghosts, even though the things that I have seen personally and things that I've seen with other people that happened in my own home. It's you know, you get a lot of people right now that are thinking the the ETs that are around us. You know, they're either part of a different dimension or they can phase in and out with our frequency. It could be anything. And so I, I don't want to attach it to one thing. But if I had to sit there and, and be pressed upon it, I'd say it was probably a ghost. Uh, one of the, the craziest incidents that ever happened in that house uh, when I was living down in Redding, California, Shasta County. I got a lot to say about Shasta County, but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and just fast forward just a hair more. It's about the same time period. And I, I had one of my best friends and I, I actually have a couple of best friends that would always stay with me. They would alternate at my house for the whole summer. We were just always together. I was on the phone when this happened and it was broad daylight. My parents were at work. It was me and my friend, Sean, and he was on the computer back before AOL was even a thing. And, and the way my room was set up is my, my door, my window. That's where my headboard was was right at the window and then at the foot of my bed about five feet past that is where my closet is and to the right of the closet was the door to the hallway and right there at that door was my computer desk and that's where Sean was sitting I'm on the phone with my girlfriend at the time and I'm just chatting away just laying on the bed and he's playing whatever the heck he was playing on the computer and all of a sudden I heard the click and I looked up and the door was completely shut mind you it it a lot of people say, oh, well, it could have been the air conditioning. So this is what happened. We both heard it. I stopped talking to my girlfriend. Sean looks left because that's exactly where the door was. And he just stops because he heard it too. And that door opened all the way to the little bump stop, all the way. And then immediately as soon as it hit, slam and completely just slammed itself shut. Needless to say, <laughs> I wasn't really surprised by this point about that happening. It did shock me, but I was actually comforted that I had a friend there. And then he's seen it too, so I'm not going crazy now. And uh, I'm still friends with him, by the way. Uh, it's the last time he ever stayed at my house. So my girlfriend at the time said, well, what was that about? Why is he yelling? And I said, oh, he just met George. And he, what? what happened? And I explained it to her, and he opened that door. He shot up out of that chair and opened that door immediately. Of course, there's nothing there. And that was the only thing that happened that whole time. Immediately, he marched out of that house. Of course, I was right behind him. I had hung up the phone by that point. And uh, that was it for him. That was too much. And he's, I have to go. I'm going to call my mom. 
I got to get out of here. And so we waited out in the driveway and until he got a ride home. And I mean, I, he, we still love each other to death. We've been friends for many, many years. And but he will never stay in the night of my house again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to love him for that. Got to love him for that. You made an interesting comment about George and, and the fact that you've had things following you all around wherever you've moved. Why do you think you're such a beacon of the phenomena? Good question. Um, let me let me run that through me real quick. I don't believe that it, it was actually, I don't think George was actually following me. I think he was actually following my grandmother. And the reason why is because she finally, I mean, she's passed now, but before she had passed, she had disclosed to me that, that he would, he would actually touch her like physically. And it was, it was always in the same spot. And it was always just, she says it was always a good feeling. I said, okay, well, what, what's going on? And it was always her calf and it was always her left leg. And he would just rest her hand or his hand there whoever's and he would just give a slight little squeeze and that was it and he would move on and she started feeling that when certain things would happen in the house and especially during the nights that i would get really really disturbed and scared and i mean i would get to the point where i'd lose my voice i was so frightened uh depending on the entity that was there i would go into their room and just wake her up and be like hey i, I need and she's like oh yeah you know last night i kind of figured something was going to happen you know george stopped by and said hi and it took her years before she would actually disclose that to me and start talking to me about it. And even though my grandfather's a non-believer of ghosts, you know, there's been certain things that happened to him that are just absolutely mind boggling. And I've even, I, I even had to tell him one day, I said, okay, there's no way that you can describe or even figure out how what just happened happened. So you tell me if you believe in ghosts and, uh, and he's, he would say, no, no, I must have just took it back there. And, and that's a good story, too. And that, that involves a coffee cup. <laughs> what happened to the coffee cup? I'm eating uh, breakfast one morning. My grandfather, like clockwork, 6 o'clock in the morning, he's usually up before that, makes everybody coffee. He sets his coffee cup, the one that's got all the black rings in it, because he uses it over and over again, right on the counter. Poured his coffee, turned around, went to pour his milk. I'm sitting less than five feet away from him at the bar. So we had a bar. He was on one side of the bar in the kitchen side. I was on the other side of the bar sitting in on one of the stools eating my cereal. And this is actually here in Southern Oregon when this happened. This is after he had gone from Shasta County down in Redding, California and moved up to Oregon with us. And that's how I knew he moved with us. The coffee cup's gone. I didn't notice it. I had no idea. I didn't see it move. Nothing. All I know is my grandfather sat there, was making coffee, and he turned around and he just he just stops. And he says, son. And I looked up. I said, yeah, dad. And he goes, what did you do with my coffee cup? I, I didn't do anything to it. And he goes, well, where, where'd you put it? I said, yeah, I've been sitting here right here just eating my, my breakfast. I didn't I didn't move it. And so he puts the milk away and he looks in the fridge thinking he put it in the fridge. He looks for his coffee cup in the cupboard. It's not there. I mean, he thinks he's losing his mind. Uh, you know, and it, I mean, he's in his 80s now, but he was only 63 when this happened. And so he starts looking for it. And we both start looking for it. Because to me now, I'm like, okay, what just happened here? This is interesting. You'd never guess where he found it. And so it's a ranch-style home. You know, you have a garage, kitchen, and everything else is spread all the way across this, you know, 100-foot house. That coffee cup made it over a hundred feet down a hallway into the master bedroom, into the master bathroom, sitting on the counter, still piping hot. And it was just poured. And when he found it, the, it was actually quite interesting because I was, I was still looking around in the kitchen for this. And I heard, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard somebody call your name when they're, they're pretty startled or scared and they get that shakiness to it. So when he called my name and I heard that, I immediately knew that he found his coffee cup. And I walked back all the way back in the back room, went in there, and there it sat. And I said, do you believe me now? And he goes, I, I just don't remember bringing it in here. I said, you didn't, Dad. You didn't bring it in here. And uh, he, he won't talk about that to this day. Wake up, Pop. 
You got yep. some ghosties. You got a George <laughs> in your house. Yeah, a George. Yeah. No kidding. Grant Baker is with us. Incredible experience here. We got four minutes left before we got to go to break here. You know, with the extraterrestrials that, that came around as a childhood, in your childhood rather, did it continue? Did oh, yes. UFOs start coming around? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I can only... I couldn't even count how many UFOs I've seen. And and a lot of them have really interesting stories, but they're they're always from afar. Uh, the ones that I see when when I just get that feeling, look up, uh, I get a lot of those. In fact, I got a great video of one I should send to you. It actually looks like a plane until you realize I'm using an iPhone. I'm tracking this thing. And the star that is static right next to it is blinking at the same rate. So you know how far out this thing is. And uh, I also looked at the... Uh, uh, satellite radar uh the, also one of the plane things that you can see where all the planes are so either it was one of two things it was either ufo or, or three things a satellite that is not on one of the satellite apps that you can see so it's probably a military satellite or a military plane that doesn't show up on one of the one of the flight apps that you can get so it was moving and it was so far away and it was moving so fast my bet's a ufo and i've, I've seen so many of them especially down in shasta county uh, down by Mount Shasta. The things that happen down there are wild. I've seen so many things, including the lenticular clouds. If anybody's wondering, look up the lenticular clouds of Mount Shasta in Northern California. And those things look just the clouds themselves like UFOs. They're wild. They're absolutely gorgeous, though. And I can see them. Well, not from my house right now. There's a mountain between us or a hill. But if I just drive five minutes, I can see all of Mount Shasta and, and get good shots of those clouds and some of the crazy stuff that happens over there. And it's all the time. I've never stopped seeing them. Why you? Good question. Why not? I mean, I don't think it's just me. I think it's everybody. I, I want to say, you know, I mean, you're, you're doing this for a reason. Everybody that's listening to us right now is listening to us for a reason. Whether you've seen it, believe in it, you know, I don't understand why I'm dealing with certain things, but I think everybody's actually dealing with it in some way, shape, or form. They some just might not realize it, especially with the the beings that come in during the night. And uh, I've gotten used to them. Um, I don't like it when they do this. And when they try to hold you down, I really don't like that feeling. I've learned how to get out from under it. I've also just, I don't know why me, I, I couldn't answer that, but I, I think that everybody's dealing with it. So it's not just a, a solitary random thing where like, oh, this guy gets it, this guy doesn't. I, I think everybody at one point or another has dealt with it, whether they know to recognize it or not. Is this a family tradition? <laughs> well, with the ones that talk about it, yeah. <laughs> a lot of my well, family. That, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. We got about 45 seconds here. Gotcha. You know, for you, I mean, you mentioned earlier that your wife is an experiencer. Was she an experiencer mm -hmm. before you met? Yes. Yeah. And her experiences are, are more of the, the uh, sleep paralysis, what people call sleep paralysis. And I've learned uh, actually fairly recently that that's actually not exactly what it is. And uh, we can go into that later, but that when I was talking to you about the other podcast that you had done with that other gentleman, I found out those are grays because you can see them. And we've actually seen the same thing at, at different times. So it's... I hear you there. Yep. I hear you there. Grant, I'm going to get you to hold on right there as we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. A life of experience. This is what it's like. You just live with it. I mean, if you look at Grant's calm demeanor this is because he knows how to react now it's everyday life it's a part of life for those who have the experience when we come back in hour two of spaced out radio this goes beyond aliens we're going to get into some sasquatch next on spaced out radio we'll take your questions in our chat rooms as well hour two with our guest grant baker next on the mighty sor
All right. Very cool. I got to show our audience something here. Merle put together a pretty good uh, video here. Let me just uh, pull it on up on the old Chrome tab. There we go. For Canada's great unknown today, I'll play it for you guys. It's actually really good. He, we're pretty proud of it. Well, cool. We're up to 307. We were at 304 last time I checked. Okay. Here you go. This is from, uh, oh, that's the, uh, when, yeah, here we go. I'll restart. Canada, Canada a, bastion a bastion of communities, of communities that, that built a nation into, into one, of one of the most beautiful places, places in the world. In the world. Canada, Canada is a place, is a place where, where people from all, from all cultures, cultures have congregated, congregated to make a, make a beautiful, beautiful mixing, mixing pot of pot life. life. Canadians, Canadians are more, are more than, than just hockey, hockey moose, moose, donuts, donuts and, the and the beavers in the ponds, in the ponds while drinking, while drinking beer, beer, saying, saying a? A? Canada, Canada is about is dreaming that life can be better and believing we can make it better, not only for ourselves, but for everyone in the world. However, Canada also has its side of mysteries and legends that have remained hidden in the dark. Legends of Sasquatch of British Columbia, the Rougarou of Quebec, ghost ships of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, to the ghosts of the battlefields in Ontario, UFOs lighting up the sky, and aliens walking among us. Welcome to Canada's Great Unknown, where Dave Scott of Spaced Out Radio and Merle from the Paranormal Road Trippers have combined to bring you some of Canada's creepiest stories. Stories from Canadians of all walks of life who've allegedly encountered things they just can't quite explain. It's these stories that we bring to you to tell another side of the Great White North that many do not want to talk about. The encounters are allegedly real, they are happening, and they are all around us. If you are Canadian or have visited Canada and had something strange happen to you, please tell us your story at Canada's Great Unknown at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at CGU Stories and Canada's Great Unknown on Instagram and TikTok. We encourage you to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so you know when new videos are popping up on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to leave a comment on our videos to let us know what you think. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the other side of what Canada has to offer. Welcome to Canada's Great Unknown. Well, I better put that on. Yeah, that's our new piece right there. Hope you enjoyed that. That was killer. That was killer. It was kind of cool. So if you haven't already, head over to YouTube. Go to Canada's Great Unknown. We'd greatly appreciate it. I'll get you the link for it if you haven't already. More stories coming very, very soon. Where am I here? There we go. Yeah, Merle did all that up. He did it very nicely. I apologize about the echo. Oh, how funny! I have uh, I have other experiencers in that I know personally from way back in high school that are currently in the chat. They just uh, they just texted me, let me know that they're there. Oh, tell them to come in and say hello. Hit oh, that absolutely. subscribe button, ring that bell. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the gal that is texting me, I, I mean, I've been friends with her since we were little kids, but uh, she has one heck of an experience. Um, and a place that is full of experiences down in, down in Chats County. And really? uh, I don't, oh man, she, she had a good one. In fact, this is a place that I don't like going to. I've been there many, many, many times, but, uh, and, and stayed there many nights. And it's definitely something to, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting Road spot. Trip. Road trip. 
Let's yeah, in it. fact, uh, uh, um, World Bigfoot. I was going to uh, text him and tell him the exact coordinates of where to go look. And it, oh, it's so, public comment. There we go. Yeah, there you are. There she is. <laughs> yeah. Thank hey, you for the. Man. Thank you for the super chat as well, and also thank you, Kira Horror Realm and Smithy. The super chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Uh, you can't make that trip. Old Davey needs to come down there with you. I'm game for that. Derek Cook, what's happening? The SOR Mustang got a third place finish today. Right on. Right on. I love it. He built a race car, the NASCAR game, with all our logos on it. It's the it's the coolest damn thing. By the way, Derek, I actually made that my screensaver at uh, my daytime job. It looks so badass. Thank you for that. We got 30 seconds here. Hey, Kira, I know you're, uh, you just asked me where that's at. And I'll go ahead and, are we allowed to do like exact locations? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got 10 seconds. All right. Well, I'll, once we get into the Bigfoot story, I'll tell you about it. All right. All right. Thumbs up, thumbs down, hit that subscribe button. Here we go with hour two. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Quagma. Quagma is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. So follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. And now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Grant Baker. He is a lifelong experiencer wanting to know what is happening with him. And from UFOs and aliens and paranormal, we're going to go into the forest with Sasquatch now. Grant, welcome back. Uh, thank you so much. Good to be back. Oh, what do you got for me with Sasquatch? I got a good one for you. What do I got? Well, let's just hear your story, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll rate it out of 10. We don't mind. All right. All right. So Shasta County, and if anybody's ever listening, Shasta County is a place of interesting things. In fact, I have a couple uh, ideas about why it's so interesting. It's because of the iron in the dirt. UFOs, for some reason, like a couple things. Iron, water, obviously, and the skies. When it comes to Sasquatch, though, that is something that is actually a global phenomenon. Not a lot of people, everybody thinks it's the Northwest. Uh, there's a lot of places dedicated to it here in Oregon. And uh, they always think, oh, it's just happening in Oregon. And that is it's semi-true. I haven't seen anything here. My wife's dad has, but let's... Uh, Let's rewind back to Redding, California. There's a place called Buckeye. It's Buckeye School District that's down there. And I used to go to that school. In fact, I lived just south of it. And where I lived at that time, now there's housing development everywhere. But there's still a canyon. Not really a canyon. I guess you would call it like a gulch of some sort. And uh, this ravine, gulch, canyon is big enough to be called a canyon. Actually stretched from behind my house. All the way down to Shasta Lake. And a, a lot of crazy things happen at Shasta Lake as well. So it's a lot of red dirt, a lot of Manzanita, and it's it's in Northern California. So it's really arid, it's really dry, and it's really hot. And one day I'm literally playing in the red dirt, like all good children wearing white clothes that loves their mom does. And uh, I was out there playing G.I. Joe's and 
I'm right between 10 or 11, uh, 11 years old. I want to say right before I turned 11 years old. And I'm just playing around. I have a Red Rider BB gun to my right. And it's about, oh, I don't know, a 15 to 20 foot oval of clear area right behind our house uh, where the, the manzanita had been cut away. And there's no grass to speak of. So I'm just digging holes in this clay like dirt. And I had that feeling that I always get, you know, I don't have anything telling me the book or, or anything. And I, but I just had a feeling look in this direction and I'm crouched down on my tippy toes, got my little GI Joe's in my hand and I look left. I just follow the, the feeling and I just look left. And I didn't know that I was looking at it first. I mean, the manzanita trees are probably about seven, eight feet tall. And, uh, when I realized what I was looking at, I was looking at legs. I was looking at, I didn't, I didn't actually see the feet, which is interesting. I was, all, all I remember seeing was legs. So what in the world is that? And, and I started scanning up. You know, the manzanita is not a really bushy tree. Uh, it's really neat for kids to play with, with the bark, but um, you can still see through it. And I followed this, this form all the way up and met eyes with this creature. I don't know. Um, it's, I think I would be more scared meeting like a, a, a skunk on the side of the road and, and meet, you know, and making eye contact with that. For some reason, I really wasn't scared that I was looking at this thing, but it made eye contact with me. And I want to tell you something about this. So a lot of people, as far as I know, and with everything that I've read now, there could be a whole lot of different stories out there. In fact, you just had a podcast on it where they explained Bigfoot in various shapes, sizes, and all over the world. When I made eye contact with this, it was intelligent. I, I recognized that right off the bat, and, it, and I, I wasn't scared. I, I did realize a couple of different things about it. It was not moving. It literally was locked in place. It was staring right at me. It was tall because... It was looking at me over the manzanita bush. I could see its face clearly. Uh, there's a couple things. By that time, at 11 years old, 10, 11 years old, I had known what Sasquatch was. I thought it looked like the abominable snowman, except black or brown. This was neither. This being, creature, whatever you want to call it, was not fat. I've watched the, the, uh, uh, the, the one Bigfoot footage that everybody sees of the female Bigfoot walking from left camera, right camera. And if you actually have the destabilized or the stabilization of that photo, you can see that it is a woman or a female being, and it turns and looks back. I've watched that over and over and over again. I've actually looked at a whole lot of other different Sasquatch photos, pictures, everything I could, and I've never seen anything in any of those that match what I've seen. So this is Roughly, I mean, I was small back then, so being 40 now or 42 now, if I was looking at the same thing, I might give you a little bit different description of it. It was tall. Minimum of eight feet. Period. And it was not black. It was not brown. It was gray. Kind of like, I mean, like, a, like I just don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's like gray hair, you know. It was just gray. And it, it was very intelligent, forward-facing eyes, and the face did not match any other other of the Sasquatches or the, the Bigfoots that I've ever seen before. It was more our profile, maybe a, a little more angular, a lot longer head, and I didn't see any ears. The eyes were dark, and it was perfectly still, and it was yoked. And when I say yoked, I mean, that's I, I kind of use that jokingly, but it, it was literally in the best fit I've ever seen anybody in my life. This thing was not like massive, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was fit. You could see muscle definition. You could see it had perfect Popeye type arms and, and you could see its nice rounded shoulders under the fur. I mean, this thing was this thing was fit. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, what is that? I, obviously, I knew what it was. I was just like, oh, man. So this little Red Rider BB gun that I had sitting right next to me, it was it was completely empty. There was nothing in it. And I didn't know what to do. We literally locked eyes 
for about 10 seconds, uh, realistically about 10 seconds. And it seemed like forever. And I reached down and I started to pick up this pellet gun. And that's when it did something. And instead of moving away from me, like you would think, it actually moved perpendicular. And it kind of went at about a 40, 45 degree angle right in front of me through the manzanita. Obviously, there was, you know, they're not real close together back there. And so it was weaving its way from le my left to my right at a 45 away from me. And there's a couple of things I noticed as I pumped this little Red Rider BB gun and just shot nothing but air at this thing. Was its speed. It was insanely agile and it was fast. It moved very quickly it moved silently and it was all i mean looking back on it it was beautiful i mean this thing was awesome it moved so fast that you would think something would be crashing through the trees and be, you know making the the footprints on the ground right. not nothing you didn't hear a thing i mean i i kind of heard it but barely and that's not from adrenaline and i mean i was just like even as a child i was like that was weird how did it move immediately immediately i got up and i ran to my house which was about 80 feet behind me and i went and told my mom and i, I told my mom i said mom i just seen bigfoot no no you didn't no you didn't no you didn't i, I was adamant about it um i'm going to tell you about two weeks ago I, I talked to my my stepfather um my, obviously, I told you my mom's passed, but my, my stepdad is still alive. And I, and I asked him a few questions about that area. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. There's a lot of things in that canyon. And that canyon goes all the way to the lake. And he goes, I believe you. And I heard things out there. Never seen anything. And I said, well, I told mom about it. And she didn't believe me. And he goes, it's not that she didn't. It's just she was trying not to make a big deal about it. And she didn't want to talk about it. I said, oh. And I wish she had, but. Hey. Well, you know, at times parents try to protect their young ones, right? I mean, oh, yeah. she doesn't want you to have the nightmares or, or a worst case scenario, going out there and chasing after it when it could do something very harmful. You didn't know. I mean, was it watching you to stalk you? Was it watching you to take mm -hmm. you? Was it watching you out of mild curiosity? I mean, you, you'll never know. I got a feeling, and, and, and I, I want to run this by you a little bit. I have a feeling what happened was because our house at that time was kind of one of three houses that were just kind of built off this little dirt road. Now it's fully paved. I think what had happened based on the, the direction after I looked at exactly where he came from, um, I asked my, my stepfather exactly what the address was, what the street was, and I, I looked it up recently in order to prepare for being here because I wanted to know more myself about it as well. And... I looked at it and I think he accidentally happened upon me and really didn't really know what to do. And just kind of, you know, like it's kind of like us. If we come across a bobcat, don't move my right might go away. I think that's what happened. And once I moved, then he was like, uh Oh, and he was gone. Right. He didn't show any hostility towards me at all. Randy wants to know, how do you think they move so silently? Hmm. So that's a good question, Randy. There's a couple of things I've actually, <laughs> you're going to laugh at me. I actually practice this for a little bit. Um, instead of running heel toe, like most people do, uh, there's a, there's actually a way to move your, your body where you can walk around your house. A lot of parents do this. You go toe heel first. And the way this thing moved as big as it was, it, I could still hear it, but I think what had happened was it was more a, a very eloquent. I mean, this thing was graceful. Like you would think all the noises people were hearing in the woods and everything else is, and the, the clattering and the gifting and everything you hear about these things. These things are actually pretty graceful. Uh, they can move silently. And honestly, I've heard stories about people saying, oh, yeah, you know, they're just part of a different dimension. I've heard other people say they're grace. I, or other ETs that have come over and and they're not really real. The thing that I saw made shadows. I heard it. I seen it. It was physical and it ran for me. That's enough for my eyes. And I don't know how he moved quite as silently as he did, but I mean, his ninja skills were 100. Unbelievable. 
Manuel wants to know what your scariest experience is. Oh, Dave. Hey, Dave, tell you. What is the scariest experience? Okay. I mean, obviously, the, the, the one with the... Oh, no. The five-year-old, that, that, that's, that's nothing. Well, let me so, rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. Does anything, I mean, outside of getting spooked or startled, do you get scared anymore? No, not not anymore. In fact, when I have the sleep paralysis, I actually, I try to hit them. I know it's it's just a reaction. Man, The man inside of me, uh, I literally turn and, and, and get rid of them very quickly when they're trying to hold me down. But the, the scariest thing that I think I've ever gone through, I, I do have one. And... Um, uh, uh, to answer everybody's question, or actually Kira's question, is is Shasta County. Anybody wants to go down there, go down to uh, Sheep Camp, which is just off of the marina. It's actually, if you go to Whiskey Town Lake, you pass the marina. Um, uh, about 150 feet, there's going to be a left-hand road. Go down that road. You're going to see the orbs. You're going to hear the noises. You're going to hear the earth talk to you crazy and uh at shasta lake there's a lot of things that happen as well down there i was down there in shasta lake at, at a place called jones valley resort um I'm not quite at the resort but jones valley road it literally just goes to the jones valley campground or you could take a slight left and go right to that finger of the lake uh, there's 365 miles of shoreline on shasta lake i just happen to be on one little portion of it and I was with a friend's mother, actually, who was having a pretty bad day. And we were just sitting there having a beer, and she was talking about her woes and, and just didn't understand. Of course, I just happened to be there for her, which is great. And while she was talking, I was looking up at this guy. And I noticed this overbright star doing figure eights. And, and I mean, like, vertical and horizontal. So we would do horizontal and then it would just change into vertical and it would stop randomly and i watched it i mean i i probably had a beer and a half by the time i looked at this i'm like i can still drive i'm not drunk i just ate dinner so i mean I, uh, what's what is this so finally i ended up interrupting the gal that i was with i said hey can you look up there and tell me exactly what you see i didn't point i just said look in the sky and tell me what you see because I've always been scared that I'm the only one seeing it. That that star is moving. What is it doing? It's doing figure eights. Up and down or left or right? Up and down. Okay. Oh, it stopped. Oh, okay. We watched it for a few minutes. Anyway, I, after a while of watching this, it's maybe three minutes, two, three minutes. It seems like forever. But every time that one in the sky would stop, one to our right would start and i just caught it out of my peripherals and i i was like oh there's another one over there and every and they would just switch like a light switch this one would do it that one would do it this one would do it and i was like oh my goodness and so i told her about it i said hey let's go up there because there's fire roads that go up there and now this is really dry arid place but there's a lot of trees and a lot of red dirt and a lot of hills i can get there no no we shouldn't go i know i want to go see what that is and, right okay yeah and so we jump and now bear in mind i have i have this little four-door suzuki sidekick anybody that knows of those things they're just they're a box of glass on wheels and we go flying up there i mean i i'm just grabbing gears i i gotta see what this is dave i'm t I'm, I'm gonna tell you something I, I don't know exactly how i can explain this and i told you about the the darkness before you know coming into the room in the bedroom or the hallway and uh, this is one of those times where I couldn't explain it, and I wasn't the only one that seen it. We started getting close, and every now and then I could see, I could still see the one in the sky, and I would just get a glimpse of the one that was in front of us because I was getting pretty close to it. And all of a sudden, I mean, this is ten o'clock at night. There's, there's stars, no lights out in the lake. I mean, there's no light pollution, no cities, nothing. And the headlights worked fine. My taillights worked fine. You can see outside. You can see the dirt fire road that I was on. You can see the trees and the rocks and everything else that was beside us. 
And all of a sudden, it was nothing. It was black. It was like I was in a, a like I, I've tried to explain it to people before. It was like being in a black velvet veil where my headlights shined, but you couldn't see them. You couldn't see the road. You couldn't see the trees. There was nothing outside either of our windows. She freaked, startled me because I slammed on the brakes. I could even see the taillights. I, I knew my taillights lit up, but I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see anything out my rear view mirrors. Nothing. I looked out my windows. There was no tint. There was nothing on them. And she says, I think we need to get out of here now. Yeah. I said, <laughs> and yeah. And I said, I think you're right. I'm, and I'm, I, this is the weirdest thing. So when I backed up, I'm only on a fire road. The, the car's not that big, but still, you know, I have a drop off that I got to be careful with. I got a little, you know, little gutter of water that runs down this fire road on the other side. So I, I want to back up just so. I backed up about 12 feet. Everything came back. Everything came back. It was like it just lifted and I could see everything. I could see the gravel. I could see the trees. I could see the sky. I could see everything. I turned around, got out of there. So that's not even that's not even half the scary part. So we go home and uh, we didn't even talk about it. Her two children, who I happen to be friends with, and their significant others. I had an 89 Dodge Ram Charger as well, and, and it could hold six people. And, uh, and, and it was loaded to capacity. And we happened to be having a little shindig down in a place called Anderson, California, which is by Airport Road. If anybody wants to look it up, Airport Road goes right by the airport, obviously. And it ties Anderson and Redding, California together. It's a very long and straight road. Once it gets towards Hartnell, if anybody wants to look it up, you can see it. This is like two weeks later. Nighttime. We're all going home. Fully loaded truck. And I had that feeling. Look behind you. I'm driving. I'm doing, I don't know, 45. And I look. And I see it. And it's literally doing a figure eight in the sky. And I'm, I'm yeah. doing this. Oh, man. I'm one of those guys that I have to have proof. I have to have other people to see this with me. So I, I hit the brakes. I slowed down to a nice stop. And, and I said, okay, I don't want anybody to scream. But I want everybody to turn around and tell me what you see. And dang it, this thing, right as I said that, dropped down to the deck. And I mean, just off the ground, higher than a car or a truck or anything like that. You know, But as soon as it did that, because it did it right as they looked, everybody started screaming, go, 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 go. My truck does like 80 miles an hour on a good day. <laughs> so I floored it. And uh, I took a little cut off. Uh, and as soon as we took the left to shoot over to Hartnell, it was gone. And it scared the lights out of everybody. We talked about it for a few minutes. And the craziest thing, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, when you have an experience that's that dramatic, I don't understand it when I look back on it. Why do we not talk about it? What, what happens? Why does it? Why do people, oh, yeah, you know, that happened. And then you just kind of, you just, it's a memory. I never got it, but that thing chased us. We went around a corner, and it was gone. Unbelievable. My friend, your stories, your encounters are amazing. And the way you are detailing them for our audience tonight is fantastic. You know, we're you're painting good pictures for us, man. I'm actually watching replays in my head of what you're saying, and holy cow. The bad thing is, I got I got a ton more. I know we're running out of time, <laughs> but I got I can tell you all kinds of them. I mean, they're just and and it, the crazy thing is, is is where they're all located. So if anybody's interested to see all these, get a hold of me through Facebook, and I, I will literally pinpoint locations for you and send them to you. Uh, half of them, you're on your own. Grant, I'm gonna get you to wait right there. Grant Baker, we got him till the top of the hour. Fantastic. Fantastic personal encounters with Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens, and ghosts. More stories with Grant when we return on Spaced Out Radio. Hi, gorgeous Michelle C. 
in Australia. Solaire, thanks for joining us. Sovereign Farts, good to have you ripping them back. Yeah. And who else? All right, I'm gonna just going to step away for a couple seconds, go to the bathroom. I'll be right back, dude. All right. Okay, I gotta I gotta get down to all your guys. Let's see. While he's doing that, let me see if I can go to exit full screen. And anybody have any questions? Miss Fidgety Aurora, have a good night. Good night. Good night. Go, go, Teresa. You're welcome. Absolutely. Do I think there's a higher meaning behind all these settings? I don't know. Um, it's one of those deals where I think everybody in, in the world is, we're just closed off. There's so much in the universe that we don't know about, so much. I think the higher meaning is just the meaning of life. And it's, it's whether you want to think of it as experiencing it getting to know other people that's out there in the universe. I mean, obviously there's so many entities that are going to be out there. It, it's mathematically impossible that we're the only ones. So as for it being, as for being a um, higher meaning, I, I don't know. I, I just, none of us are capable of understanding it. And until someone tells us what it is, that's the only time we're going to understand it. We can theorize all we want until they actually make themselves known. And at that point, maybe we can understand it. Have any of your guitars been invisibly played? Steve Wolf, yes, um, they have been. And uh, in fact, I told the story about that a, a little bit earlier, but it was strummed inside of this case uh, at one point. Um, these ones here, I haven't heard go off, and I don't know what happened to George, but maybe someday. How close do Bigfoot come to Sacramento? I'm pretty sure they're down there. I mean, realistically, they stay away from metropolitan areas, and uh, and they're global. I mean, they're all the way in Siberia, Russia, Germany. They're everywhere. They just have different names. Any theories on the connection between Sasquatch and X-rays? Wow. I mean, I I hear some people have theories on that. And uh, some people think that they're this one and the same. But as for what I saw, they were completely different. What's happening underground? Solaire. Uh, real quick, before I get to that, um, race fan, um, I think Bigfoot's a real entity. I think he's just basically our, our number one guy for hide-and-seek, um, which actually uh, Solaire mentioned something, actually a question that I think ties into why we can't find them all the time. So he says, uh, what's happening underground? I wonder if aliens have bases there. Uh, there if you want to talk about underground stuff a lot of i can go into detail on a lot of stuff that happens underground um not that i've seen it but theorizing everything uh, especially with admiral bird talking about antarctica uh mount shasta which is somewhere where i live right really close to uh there's all kinds of stuff happening down there and it's all underground cities and, and <coughs> the lemurians and all that i mean it's yeah they could be one and the same all right, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. Hi, Preston. How you doing? 
And we uh, want to say thank you to Surf Jer, Michael, Kira, Public, Horror Realm, and Smithy for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you so much. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and uh, we really appreciate the love, everyone. We really do. And uh, we're going to get going here in just a few seconds. And, uh, yeah, great show tonight. Great show. We pass the halfway point of Space Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, Check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Grant Baker lifelong experiencer he's been investigating what is going on with him it's not just him it's growing up with his family and now with his current family as well grant welcome back ah nice to be back thank you so much Dave. we got some questions from our audience here for you <laughs> yeah start off with manuel have you ever heard of march air force base and lockheed martin ufo abductions and encounters you know, I, I actually just read that one before we went back on, on the air. And, you know, I, I have not heard that one yet. Um, Manuel, I'm going to tell you right now, that is something I'm definitely looking into. Uh, the reason why is because all this stuff interests me. I, I want to, especially because now you have an Air Force base. I don't want to yeah. get political with anybody, but what's the one, the one people that aren't talking about anything right now and that's the air force so when you talk about the lockheed martin ufo abductions encounters and the air force in the same sentence i'm gonna go study that and uh, i'll get back to you on that one all right let's go to another question here from our audience this one comes from jonathan in the uk do you think they manifest your thoughts and alter your perception do you think the bigfoot travels as an orb that is a good question, Jonathan. Wow. Okay, so you remember when I had my, I told you my Bigfoot story, and I felt that everything was okay. I didn't feel any kind of, you know, anger towards me, anything like that. And so I, I do believe that they have an ability to at least project their feelings or their emotions. So is it, do you think Bigfoot travels in an orb? That is a great question. So... Over at Sheep's Creek off of um, Whiskey Town Lake in Redding, California, or just west of Redding, California. In fact, uh, the people that story that I'm about to tell you is in the chats right now. And this particular individual has gone to a site that I've been to a lot. Now, this site is very special, very, very special because it'll scare the living heck out of you, but it's absolutely gorgeous. There's waterfalls and, and a natural stream. But if you stay the night, you're going to hear the earth making its crazy noise. Now, when I say crazy noise, this is the earth in the middle of the night and everybody hears it. I don't care who you are. I can take you there myself right now. It's only a couple hours away from me and I'll let you, I'll let you hear it yourself. It is wild. There is not a car within 10 miles of you. There's not a city within 20 and you can hear machinery, this deep hum thrum under the earth. There's a little brook. A little stream right next to you but that's not making this kind of noise so the people that i'm talking about right now had gone down there we all have experienced this and she you know like everybody else heard the noise and then the orbs showed up which are orange and flickering kind of like you know when you see a star and it flickers but it can change colors really quickly that's what she was seeing and, and then when I say seeing an orb, I mean, she was literally within 20 feet of the thing. It was right in front of her face. It was wild. 
I have never seen an orb there at that exact spot, but I've heard the knocking on the wood. And I've heard a couple of calls that were much further in the distance. So they weren't like crazy close where it scared the heck out of me. But I've, I've heard some calls out there before. And so it only makes sense to me that orbs and Bigfoot actually might coexist in some way, shape or form, whether they're both ethereal or they're both however they mix. I don't know. But that is a good question. I'm, I like where you're going with that. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Let's go to Sovereign, who is asking, do you think Lemurians or any other subterranean civilizations are living <laughs> under Mount Shasta, have banks set up above ground for their use? Uh, the banks. All right. So here's a, here's a good, gosh, Dave, I wish I could bring you to Mount Shasta. I'm telling you right now, you would enjoy the heck out of it. Now, here's the, here's the thing with Mount Shasta that you got to respect that mountain. A lot of people go missing on that mountain. And I mean a lot. So anytime, in fact, there's uh, uh, Native Americans that live there and part of their heritage is, you know, the, the, that, that's their God, the gods and, and the people have, been created out of that mountain and or actually were saved during a hard time. I, I might be getting this wrong, so don't don't get me for this. But anyways, the Native Americans believe that we actually come from that mountain and uh, we hid inside it during the cataclysms and the, the ruining of the world. And we we had come back out. Now, there's a lot of people that have gone to that mountain and even the Native Americans don't go past the tree line. It's it's sacred ground. I won't even do it just out of respect, but I mean, it's sacred gown and a lot of people disappear. You can look it up. There's a few people, even recently, there's a, there's a gentleman that said that he met the Lemurians and, and uh, Talos, I think is the name of the city that's under Mount Shasta. Now Mount Shasta is definitely a spectacle, uh, spectacle to behold. It is beautiful, has crazy lenticular clouds that, that cover it. It, year round and and do kind of weird stuff they look like ufos all the time some of the stories about the lemurians i've never actually heard them hurt anybody usually their helpers uh there's an old man that disappeared on the mountain once um there's a 50 50 where people go climbing the mountain and it's a spot called 50 50 and just past us a little lake about 650 feet away literally that close and he disappeared never been found in that amount of time within that amount of space and his travelers which he had many we're right behind him. Uh, there's people that talk about openings in the uh, mountain and that the Lemurians are trying to use certain people as, uh, hey, you be our spokesperson. Let's get humankind that's on the, on the surface and us inside to come together. I've been on that mountain a lot of times, never seen a Lemurian. I have a lot of crazy feelings on that mountain, a lot of love. It's, it's, it's just, oh, I love that mountain. You, you, if you, as soon as you get around it, you can feel it. That mountain is awesome. I'd love to meet a Lemurian. I would love to meet one, but, uh, the bank set up, I don't know anything about the banks, but, uh, if there's anything going on at Mount Shasta, the Lemurians know about it and the people that were lucky enough to meet them. Yeah. They know about it as well. Fellow Californian Surf Jair is asking, has the government ever told you to keep quiet? Uh -uh. Surf Jair, I'm going to tell you something real quick. My wife and my family are the only ones that have heard this, except for maybe a few smattering of friends, until tonight. So if a week You're comes by... Out, you're, you're, you, everybody on this, including Dave, uh, uh, Dave kind of had a hint about it a couple weeks ago, but everybody, this is the first I've talked about it. Eddie would like to know, do you think the triangles in the sky are government related or ET spacecraft? Both. I, I believe they're both. And in fact, I, I, if I could say they're triple, they are. Uh, so most of the, I believe personally, and this could be completely wrong. I believe personally that most spacecraft that we have today that can't do things like the Tic Tac, like Commander David Fraber witnessed, um, most of the triangles that we see today that have the lights on them that blink is us. The ones that move very quickly and the ones that you can only see with night vision, which I've seen, aren't. 
because and I, I mean any military ship can shut their lights off but the ones that tell me look up and when i'm looking up i see them i, I believe those are the ones that aren't us and then the ones that a lot of people are seeing like the tr3 or whatever it is i think that's us and and i also believe that a lot of that technology is something we've gotten from other technology that we've been given gifted all right let's go to sovereign again you ever seen pets or people vanish and thought to yourself that it was just some trick of the eye but in reality they did vanish when they walked behind something uh, i've only seen videos of that I've, I've never seen it firsthand um there's there's some very tantalizing videos where hey look where'd this dog go and it went behind it like it just walks behind a tree but comes from a different direction i i've never seen it firsthand though no i don't know how i would react to something like that i'm a little paranoid about stuff like that it just doesn't feel good you know what i'm saying it doesn't feel good you know those videos that you see have you did you ever watch the one where um the car was about to hit a pedestrian and this flashlight comes in and moves the pedestrian and the car yeah. you know what i mean like that'd be great if stuff like that really happened but i honestly cgi today i'm skeptical of a lot of it me too me too have you ever been to east city ranch steve no. would like to know. no i have not and uh, I would love to, though. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you right now. So living, um, oh, what's that guy? Dr. Greer. And it, a lot of people don't like that name. But he goes to uh, uh, um, Mount Shasta and does the laser and the, the seance and everything else. You know, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. You don't need to pay any money for it. Just go out there with love in your heart and, and a and a, and a, and a just an open mind and love in your heart and, and protection. And anybody can do that. But the East City Ranch, yeah, I'd love to go do that. Mm -mm. Oh, so would I. Oh, yeah. So I, would I. I would be a big fan of that. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. All right. I want to ask you because, you know, we do have other questions that, that we'll get to here momentarily. Yeah. But for you, when you look back and everything and you see, that now it's continuing. What is continuing now for you? <sighs> yeah, the um, it's the hard ones that continue. I mean, the fun ones are, are anytime I walk out that door, I, I look up and, and when I see something that shouldn't be there, that, that's the fun ones to me. Um, the ones that are really hard for me are the, the ones that happen in the middle of the night and it's like a full body you're, you're held down and you see the shimmering person that's next to you or the shadow person. And I, I ended up getting to the point where I just fight those off. I really don't like those. I, I don't like messing with them. Entities, beings, whatever they are. I'm fully awake when it happens. And my wife has experienced the same thing. So I know I'm not making it up. And it's like, I, I would really rather just have a full night's rest and not deal with that kind of stuff. But when it comes to, spacecraft that i see outside that's that's the one i i would love i just i love it every time i see it it really does kind of open your eyes to everything that goes along now are you somebody who can summon in any type of craft or summon in any type of experience no unfortunately i i wish i was and uh the craft is is actually getting far and few between um I don't. I, I kind of got it in my head that there's something that changed in me, uh, and and it actually makes me kind of feel bad. I like to, what what did I do wrong that I, I'm not seeing as many of these as I used to. Whereas you know the midnight experiences or the two o'clock in the morning experiences, they just, they just keep happening, uh, but they're random. But it's I don't know. I I enjoy it for the most part. For the most part, people are like. Really? Yeah. For the most. What's there to enjoy? Anyways, Mr. Gray Owl, do you consider simulation theory as a possible reality that can explain some of the wide variety of high strangeness people experience? Hmm. Oh, um, 
simulation theory, huh? There's there's a lot of great minds that are out there that are, you know, interested in simulation theory. But I mean, it's it's completely possible. I I don't have the the proof of anything. I haven't read any any kind of science behind it. It could be real. I mean, there's there's times where. Oh, what is that called? The uh, where things change. Uh, um, what's the name of that that effect that where you remember it as one way and it's now another? Mandela. The Mandela effect. Yes, that's that's probably the closest I can come to being a simulation theory. Now, when you get people like these great scientists that are out there saying that we're probably not in the prime or base. Uh, a reality it could be i i mean are we just a glorified sims in a machine somewhere and we're making a sims i mean it's only a matter of about 10 years now that that we're going to have a sims that's so realistic we're not going to be able to tell the difference between us and it but i don't think a lot of the the strangeness that we see is based on assimilation theory i think it's just we don't understand the universe as it sits we don't understand the power that's there. I mean, uh, there's books out there that you can look at and, and they kind of resonate as true, like the electric universe. Everything functions and bounces off everything else. So like a, you know, the the, the picture of the, the galaxies, you know, the thousand galaxies that the Hubble Space Telescope, Telescope took, those galaxies that are hundreds of thousands of light years away, they still affect our galaxy so it's it's kind of like a i can understand the simulation theory but i just can't wrap my head around it it's, it's there's too much it's too much i fully agree with you on that one fully agree with you moving forward what do you want to see happen for you hmm. i mean for myself I mean, just have a normal, boring life, I guess. But I mean, realistically, for myself, I got everything I want. I got I got a, a loving wife. I got kids, and yeah, I have some weird experiences every now and then. And uh, so, moving forward, I got everything. What I would like to see for humanity is a little bit different. I would I would like us to wake up. And I'm not even awake, even though I'm having these experiences. I'm not even awake, not fully, at least. Okay. Uh, in regards to that, and if this is too personal, please let me know. Nah, nah, nah. But are your children experiencing things now? Hmm. Uh, let's see. This is one, two, three, four. So four houses ago, um, we lived over in a town called Grants Pass, Oregon. Every single one of us, including the kids, felt this weird, not a good feeling inside this one room. And they were scared out of their minds to be in there. I walked in there one night and the kids weren't even there. They, they were spending the night somewhere else. And I just, I heard some noises, went through the house, went into that room. As soon as I walked in that room, I felt it. And I was like, oh my, I mean, just hair stand on end not a good feeling it was it was all bad and and my wife felt it too the kids felt it so yeah they're they're starting to feel it they haven't told me anything about sightings or uh, which is funny because my 11 year old my son he wants to see a ufo so bad that he i mean he i bought him night vision goggles he wants to go out every single night whether it's a school night or not just to go watch the heavens and find one and uh he hasn't seen one yet but we're on track too. So, <laughs> do you encourage your children to look for this? Oh, considering absolutely. even even with the experience that that you don't know what they're going to be going through. Yeah, I, I, I mean, why not be prepared? Yeah, if they see it, great. If they don't, then they're just not going to believe dad. But uh, why not be prepared? Because, I mean, I, I, Hollywood does it for us. 
everything that we see on the movies, you know, it's going to desensitize you to this kind of stuff, even though I will admit I've never seen anything in Hollywood match the gray that I seen in real life. And when I was five years old, but you know, if, if you just, if they're going to have fun with it, make it fun. Don't make it something that's scary. That way, when something does happen, they're not going to be so scared. And uh, I, whether it happens or not in a lifetime, one final question from our audience comes from Jonathan in the UK. Do you believe they are dead people, ghosts, or dimensional entities? Hmm. So that's a good one. Um, I don't know what happens when you're dead. I, I kind of have a, a theory. Well, so when you die, nobody knows what happens. But we do know scientifically that you lose the spark of life. And that goes away. That spark cannot be transformed. It cannot be. Um, well, it can be transformed, but it cannot be created or destroyed. So the energy that's inside you goes somewhere, right? So in my theory is the electric universe actually makes a little bit more sense to me. Whereas you go back to, and I hate to quote this or say this because everybody says, oh, it's a movie, The Matrix. You go back to the source or the energy. And I think what happens is, is most people, when they die, their energy goes somewhere whether you I don't know whether you're reborn into another life I don't know if you turn into a rock for a millennia or how, what I don't know what happens um, the dimensional entities actually kind of make sense to me a little bit as well because energy can be dimensional you cannot see electricity go ahead and take a light bulb out of your uh, out of one of your light sockets and leave the, the power on don't do this anybody but if you touch it it's gonna shock you you can't see it but it's still there so yes, they can be dimensional. I, I I don't know if there's another me five seconds before me saying the exact same thing, or if someone's doing a hundred percent different activities than I am, but we share the same DNA. DNA. So I, it's it's all up in the air. I wish we had the the answers to that question, but we don't. What would you like to solve? Mm. I would honestly baby steps um, short of an, a, a spacecraft landing on the White House lawn. I, I would like to at least. I mean, look, I don't know. This, that's, that's a good one. What would I like to solve? I think a lot of this planet has a lot to solve before we ever find out what's going, really going on in the universe. I mean, look, look at. Um, I won't mention uh, an actual direct name, but look at certain pandemics that happen in in uh, globally, and people freak out. You know, store shelves are empty and everything else. Could you imagine what would happen if a, a UFO actually oh, yeah. came around? Yeah, I mean, That's exactly my opinion. Exactly my opinion, and I stated that last night on Science Bob and Friends. So oh, like, I oh, missed that one. Uh, and they were like, oh, society's ready. I'm like, I disagree with you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, people are brave until put in that situation. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't matter how bright your mind is. You could be as smart as science, Bob, you know, or as much of an oaf as I am. And you don't know what, how you're going to react until you're put in that situation. And I don't yeah. have a lot of hope for society when the aliens come. My friend, we got 30 seconds left. Let everybody know how they can get in touch with you. Uh, my name is Grant Baker. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, don't check anywhere else because I really don't have anywhere else to go to. Um, my name is actually Grantavius here on YouTube. I don't post a lot of videos. This is my first time in the limelight. If you guys want me to do kind of any kind of things, post more or do something or make videos just let me know man i got all the equipment i can do whatever you want but yeah just hit me up on on facebook i've met a lot of great people through sor and i'm happy to be here happy to meet the people i met can't wait to meet you in real life grant baker everybody what a story absolutely love it we're going to continue with our three we got swamp dweller we got Super Duke next on Spaced Out Radio. Great job, buddy.
Great job. Hey, thank, thanks for having me, brother. I really appreciate it. That was awesome. And the bad thing is I didn't even get through all the stories I had. I was like, do I have enough for two hours? And my wife's like, yes. <laughs> you did awesome. You did awesome. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you so much. You go enjoy your night. Get you back too. and get your ass back in that chat room. You bet. I will. I'll see you in a minute. Pleasure, Grant. Yeah, pleasure. Take care. Bye. Grant Baker, everybody. How good of a show was that? How good was that? The Grant Tavius one, Grant Baker, right there. Look who's hiding in the background. Super Duke. Super Duke. Hey, Dave. How you doing? <laughs> a lot better than a couple days ago. You know, I have to admit that, uh, like in Lord of the Rings, where it all matters how much elvish blood you've got, you know, I, too, have oafish blood. So we're at least half oafs, both of us. And yes. that's what Sasquatch finds adorable about us because we're so oafish and we're like Mr. Magoo and we walk right into a tree. And they're like, oh, that poor pitiful idiot. We better follow him around and make sure he doesn't fall off a clap or something. You got that right. <laughs> you got that right. Too high of a oafish blood content. That's the problem. <laughs> Damn it. Grant makes me want to go down to Klamath Falls, man. In that whole or southern Oregon area by Shasta. Very oh, active. Yeah. <clears throat> hugely active i was actually thrilled uh, a couple of years ago my friends in swamp ridge will are over touring in the area and they went by some little gift shop and they had a poster of a sasquatch at mount st helens somebody had painted mount st helens with a sasquatch standing there looking over its shoulder so they brought that back and gave it to me and i was like well thanks you guys that was mighty nice and they're like well thanks for getting us almost three million more listens on your show that was nice of you <laughs> Right? Right? Love those guys. Oh. They're awesome. I totally forgot what I was going to talk about on Dave 101 tonight. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Well, I had to make a change of plans because I've got so much information on the one story I wanted to tell tonight that I literally can't do it in 15 minutes because I have more backstory and other connected stories and whatnot. So I'm going to have to default to uh, one of my, my friends here that I actually used to live with about 10 years ago who at the time did not believe in Bigfoot and has since then actually been watching my show and connecting dots on things that have happened to him in the past. And now he's a hundred percent sure they're real. <laughs> Damn. And wait until you hear the two encounters that he's got that I'm going to, actually I'm trying to get him on the show because he can fill an hour and a half with all the stuff that's happened to him <laughs> that he was trying to disbelieve and convince himself it was not Sasquatch related. And a couple incidents have just happened in the last few years that have just like completely blown that little bubble up. And it's like, no, this stuff's real. They're out there. Mm hmm. Let me get rid of this heartburn. Oh. Yeah. When you get older, you can't eat the same stuff as when you were a kid. Oh, I had such a great dinner tonight. <laughs> And then what your stomach this? went, what the heck is this? This is stuff we used to eat when we were kids. What should we do with it? Send it back up? Nah, just burn it. Set it on fire. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you there. <clears throat> I got to figure out what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably come back later on as uh, Swampy's going or, or I'm talking. One or the other, you'll think of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Swamp Dweller, what an output, man. Be able to turn out that much content all the time. That oh. guy must be doing nothing but working. He, every day. It's every day for him. But when you're that popular, you know, people want their, you you can't stop. I, I, he'll take holidays, but you, you just can't stop. Mr. Favorite YouTuber, what or how's it going? Or my favorite YouTuber, sorry. Welcome <laughs> to the channel. Well, showed up late. God damn, I got to figure out my topic. <laughs> notepad, Dave. Notepad. I. That's my problem. I went to write it down and I forgot. You forgot the notepad. <laughs> I'm gorgeous. Marlena, how are you? 
K. Murray. Like, what am I supposed to do, dude? <coughs> Marilena Bonavite has been on my show before, telling us Jeremy about Jones, Chris, what's happening. Chris. Well, I've got like five minutes to figure it out. <laughs> Mother of Pearl. Mother of Pearl. <laughs> well, I have to go back and watch your show when I get done recording here with you because I was busy recording my upcoming show with Robert Kreider, so I missed right. almost all of it. And whenever right. you got a cryptid guest on, especially, I got to go back and watch it. So I'll be up late work, working and watching your show tonight. Nice. Tonight's a good one. Tonight's a good one to re-listen to. Yep. Well, Girl, you know, Frank, it's very rare that you get any kind of spuds on here as far as the cryptid people. You're getting mostly A-listers all the time, so that's great. Some channels right. are not nearly so good. <laughs> all right, here we go. Let's do this, Super Duke. To put you on mute. <coughs> Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much. For taking the time to join us, we really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight. In the SOR Space Travelers Club, Quagma. Quagma is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok. At Spaced Out Radio. All right. It is that time once again where we head deep into the swamp where Mr. Swamp Dweller from the YouTube channel Swamp Dweller tells us another spooky story. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. For as long as I can remember... I've always heard of the creature called Sasquatch inhabiting the woods of Southern Illinois. Ever since I was a child, when I heard that every generation of my family since we immigrated to Southern Illinois from Germany in 1840 have had encounters with Sasquatch, I started to spend a lot of time in the woods. Now bear in mind, leading up to this encounter, I had always heard that Sasquatch had been known to be aggressive with humans, but like most people, I thought it would never happen to me. Little did I know, I would never be more wrong when it came to Sasquatch. On a night in April of 2017, everything would change. My outlook on these creatures of the forest would change forever. Leading up to the encounter, I had been hearing sounds coming from a patch of woods that were off of my family's property, maybe for a little over three weeks. They were whoops, screams, howls, the usual Bigfoot signs. So one night, it was a full moon, and I decided to go in one night while the getting was good and try to get the creatures on audio and video. So, I let the necessary parties know where I was going to be. I got my camera and digital recorder, loaded up in my truck, and I drove down to the woods, where we'd been hearing the sounds come from. I walked in on foot from the main road with my gear and I found a tree structure and started to record it with my camera. 
I was hearing movement around me the whole time. My light was on the structure. So I continued on my walk. I was in the meadow that was bordered by trees, creeks, and on both sides. I came across this one creek, and I came up on the other side, and I sat down on a log to rest my back and my legs. I turned on my audio recorder to make note of what I had seen and heard through the night. Then, I reached in my back pocket and pulled out a can of tobacco and took a pinch of it, put it in my lip, and put the can back in my pocket. When I popped the lid back on, it made a really solid sounding pop, like a tree knock. About 10 seconds later, I started hearing chatter all around me at whisper level. Real quiet, but still distinct enough that you could hear speech. So I sat there, and I listened to these two or three individual creatures talking back and forth up the hill behind me, up in the trees. I was so mesmerized by listening to them that I forgot to kick my recorder back on. And this went on for about a minute. If these creatures were going back and forth like that, it kind of sounded like children talking. But it wasn't English. I don't know what language or what it could be. Then... I heard a big tree come crashing through the canopy across the creek about a hundred yards away, and I heard something cannonball the creek and come up the bank. Up out the creek came a very large Sasquatch, from what I could see in the moonlight. The creature was running across the meadow towards me where I was. So I got out of there as fast as I could. I got on the phone and called in my backup and told them it was a code black, which means aggressive individual. I made it to the main road and there was a stone culvert underneath the road. So, I got in, deep enough where I would be out of reach of the creature. I shined my light out the one end and into the woods, and I saw the creature come to the edge of the woods that I had run out of. It stood there, and watched me. Then I could see the headlights coming over the hill and across the woods. I was in the car, and a car horn going off. That's when the creature turned and walked back into the woods. I didn't realize it until I had got back to my truck after my team members dropped me off at it, but I ran out of the woods without my video camera and little tripod. I've been back to that area many times and still haven't been able to find my camera to this day. Word to the wise from this encounter. Expect the unexpected. Don't think that just because it's only happened in a country on the other side of the world, that it doesn't mean it can happen to you. Sasquatch are unpredictable and are more intelligent than we give them. All right, big thank you to Mr. Swamp Dweller for checking us on out, telling us another spooky story, and firing it up tonight. Yes, you can check out his channel on youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads. Now, sticking with Bigfoot and cryptids, we got Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio and the Cryptid Report. All right, Super Duke, how you doing, buddy? It's good to have you back. Glad to be back. Glad to be back. And rather than some ancient encounter report, we have uh, some fresh reports right out of Montana here. And right given, given to me from uh, somebody that I actually uh, know pretty well. I was roommate with him at one point. And he has an interesting background as well. He's lived here in western Montana pretty much his whole life, except when he was a little bitty kid. And um, his dad was actually the head of forestry in the area for a while. So he has quite the background of being in the woods, camping, fishing, hiking, hunting, um, prospecting, uh, gold panning, uh, picking mushrooms, picking berries, whatever, you name it. He's out in the woods as much as he can possibly get out there. So uh, when he met me, he didn't believe there was such a thing as a Sasquatch. And I told him a bunch of stories and things to look for and... At some point, he decided to uh, join my group and start watching the show and getting more information. And now in the last couple of years, he's occasionally called me and said, hey, you know, I had this weird thing happen to me. And what do you think that was? You know, and a lot of times it sounds like a Sasquatch. And so I just tell him that. And he's like, well, it can't be that because they don't exist. Okay. 
Well, until recently, you know, he's all going out mushroom picking. So he's always trying to find new places that have been pillaged by mushroom pickers because every year there's more people out there trying to get mushrooms. So he goes to this area that they camp at. It's way up this canyon, really difficult to get into. And he realistically, you can only make it about 12, 15 miles up it. And then unless you've got some kind of a ridiculous tank or four wheel drive, you're not going any further than that. And so they go up there and camp occasionally. But the road does continue for about another four miles of pretty much impassable. So he's walked up to the end of it. And at some point he got curious and went and looked on Google image and went, well, wait, when you get up to the, where the end of this thing is, it looks like there's some kind of a faint old roadbed or something up here just off the end of it. So determined to go up there and check that out. And sure enough, you walk up there to the end of it and you go a couple hundred yards off of it. And there's like an old wagon road or something from a long time ago. So he follows that a couple more, two, three miles, and there's a side canyon right next to it. So he gets curious and goes and checks out this side canyon. Apparently, it's never been logged. It's got five, 600-year-old trees in it. We're talking about Pacific Northwest giant redwood-sized trees. So he goes in there and takes a little look around. He's looking for, you know, mushrooms to pick and stuff. Well, there's all kinds of mushrooms in there. So now he's really happy. I found all this new place with all these mushrooms. Nobody else knows about it. And he started noticing that there's giant structures in there. And they're not ma even made with the local trees. <laughs> like he said, literally, there's no lodgepole pines in this valley. Somebody's been bringing in entire lodgepole pines and making structures and teepees out of them. They're even bigger than the ones you've been filming. I'm like, okay, now you got my complete attention. He said, well, I got this first quick look around and I left. I knew there were mushrooms there. So the next time I came back, I brought some friends with. And we drove the car as far as we could up the road. We brought our little radio flyer red wagons with us, determined to go up there and pick all the mushrooms we could get, fill up the wagons and drag them about four miles through the woods back to where we could get as close to it as possible with the car. So they did all this. Nothing really peculiar happened. They got back to the car, put all the mushrooms in, getting ready to go down the road. And they just went around this little corner, maybe a quarter mile. And there's a tree across the road, really big tree, about three feet in diameter tree. Well, there hadn't been any windstorm or anything since they went up there a couple hours before. So, you know, what's caused this? You know, they weren't up there more than four or five hours max. <clears throat> so he goes over with the curious eye and takes a look at it. And there's clear impressions in the ground of giant footprints of two individuals, at least, that pushed this tree over and blocked the road with it. Now, this ain't good news for them because they don't have a chainsaw. So they had to walk the remaining three or four miles back to camp again. And they were stuck there because they couldn't get their vehicle out. So they were there for two days until somebody else came up the road. And they went, thank God somebody's here. Do you have a chainsaw? Which they did. And they helped them saw the damn tree and get it out of the way so they could get their car out. Well, the next time he went up there about a month later, he took one friend with and went, hey, I got to show you this cool area. Let's hike up there. Well, when he got up there, he started having real peculiar behavior right away. He started hearing weird noises, whoops, stuff like that. When they got closer to the valley, they could hear roars coming from it, and they could see the treetops waving. Well, he isn't taking a hint very well. <laughs> so he goes into the valley with his buddy, and I know both of these guys. And they were actually ripping out smaller trees and throwing them at him. And I'm like, well, what do you think is doing that, bears? And he's like, N no. <laughs> well, what do you think it was? And he goes, well, when we got back to camp, they came and visited us all night long. And I'm not going back up there again unless I got several people heavily armed that know something about Sasquatch with me. So guess where we're going next summer? Is is Dave on that list? If Dave wants to come with and Dan, Dave wants to take a hike like that into super dangerous territory, it, 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 even if we don't see or hear anything, we get a chance to film pristine original forest that's been there for 600 years. And like most of the Pac West has been logged off at some point. But apparently this valley was too hard to get to or just who lived there wouldn't let them get near it. So it's never been logged off. It's still in its original pristine form. Now, how much time do we have left here? Uh, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Here's another report from this same guy. Now, this one happened about four or five years ago, and he was up um, panning gold in a local cream, uh, creek. It's about... 12 miles up to the, the end of the little road, access road, and it turns from pretty nice road to really lousy road to really lousy one-lane road to why am I even trying to get up here? Oh, the road's finally ended. There's a little field, 
and there was this crick. Well, the crick's got gold in it, and he knew that already up there. So he's up there all day long panning gold, and the whole day, like four or five, six hours, if anybody comes up to the end of the road, he's right near it. He can hear the vehicle. He'll know they're there. They're going to turn around and go back again. There's nowhere else to go. Nobody comes up there. So finally, at the end of the day, he's, you know, had as much luck as he thinks he's going to. It's getting close to dark. Go jump in the vehicle, head back to town. He gets about four miles down the road, and there's an obstruction in the way. Now, keeping in mind, on one side, you've got this embankment that's, like, practically straight up and down. There's a little angle to it, you know, like, yeah, that much. And then same thing on the other side, but it only drops off about 10 feet, and then you're in the forest. So steep embankment on one side, going up a couple hundred feet, forest on the other side. What's in the middle? Well, it's a, a tandem dual axle, really big pickup with a camper on it that's upside down blocking the road. And the first thing that he thinks of is, how in the hell did they flip this thing? There's no room to even flip it over. The road's one lane. So he's looking at the embankment going, did they try and drive up it and turn it around and they flipped it? Or No, there's no marks up there. He can't see anything on the lower side. It's just sitting there upside down. And then the next thing he notices is there's no damage to it. Like if it rolled over, in order to get on its top, it would do damage to the side from all the weight going over. It's just upside down. And when he gets close up to it, he can see that there's people on the far side of it. And one of them's running toward, you know, as fast as they can. It's an older couple. And the old man's coming up to him going, hey, can you help us? We don't know what happened. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know what happened? How did this thing flip over? And he goes, we had it parked in the road. There wasn't really enough room for anybody to get past us. So we figured we'd take a little short walk into the woods. So if anybody needed to get past, they'd just honk their horn. We could hear it. We'd be back at the vehicle in about a minute, and we could move it so they could try and get past us. You know, Well, what happened? Well, I don't know. We just heard this crash, and when we got back here, it's upside down. Okay, what can pick up a three-and-a-half-ton truck with a camper on it and turn it upside down without rolling it over? Chris immediately got suspicious and started looking around for tracks. But he couldn't find any. The ground was, you know, you could drive a bulldozer across at that time of the year and you wouldn't leave a track on it. So we have no idea of knowing what did this. But he managed to actually coax his car past on the embankment side and get it past where the vehicle was blocking the road and take the old lady into town to get a tow truck to come back out and get their vehicle out. They weren't even from Montana. They were vacationing from a neighboring state. So my question is, what can turn a three and a half ton truck over without rolling it? That sounds like aliens, man. That's got aliens written on it. You got there. aliens. Well, you could also have mountain giants because we know we got those out here, and they are big enough to do something like that. You think they could lift three and a half tons like that? Oh, level? God, yeah. Even the giant Sasquatch we got. Dude, in our research area, we we documented the first thing that we noticed there that got us interested in the first place was Richard Williams going into the area, driving up the pass and going, that looks like a giant X structure. That can't be an X structure. It's too big. Stopped. Walked across a little river, climbed up on the embankment, looked at it. It was an X structure and two entire lodgepole pines. Both had been moved into position. There weren't rip balls or anything on either one of them. They'd been torn out from somewhere else, moved into position. No bark, no branches on them. I've talked to three different local loggers. Okay, here's the picture. See how big these lodgepole pines are? What do they weigh? And they all gave me the same estimate, three tons each. Wow. That is crazy. That is absolutely crazy. So yeah, these the big boys in some of these places where they get really, really big, it's insane how strong they are. I mean, even a gorilla makes us look like a little wimp, and they're like a little wimp compared to like a 12-foot Sasquatch, what those guys can do. And then the other thing that freaked me out about that is even if they're physically capable of doing something like that, I don't know that they're actually physically big enough to do something like that without making a mess of it. I mean, whatever it was had to be tall enough to just pick the truck up, turn it 180 degrees, and set it down again on its rope. Because he looked at both sides. There was no roll damage or anything. He couldn't. <laughs> and all they heard was a heavy kathunk when whatever it was set it back down again. This makes me hurt my head. It's uh, it, it makes me kind of paranoid because I have to go into these areas where these things potentially are. And one of my researcher buddies, Michael, who's uh, the main man on my team, uh, number one, 
he was up in uh, one of the areas we do research in, driving down the road about two miles from one of our favorite spots, the ghost town of Coloma, and he saw a big X out in the woods, so he went and checked it out. And while he was there, he got two things happened. First of all, a peculiar feeling that something's watching you and it ain't happy. And then the other thing is he noticed a, a 25-inch track with four toes, put his foot down next to it, took a picture of it. And at that point, he decided he should take a hint and get the hell out of there, which he did. And he went back to the vehicle with his family in, which were maybe, you know, less than 100 yards away. And when he got in, his wife said, I'm so glad you came back. Me and the kids are getting scared. We got this feeling something's watching us. Wow. Mm. So, yeah, you find the giant axe. You find the, uh, you know, four-toed 25-inch mountain giant track. And something's watching me. Oh, now I'm down to the vehicle. The family feels like something was watching them the whole time I was up there taking pictures. Maybe we should leave. <laughs> Gotta love are, yeah, a step up from the Sasquatch in aggressiveness and size. We got reports of these things being up to and over 20 feet tall. Tracks uh, ranging have been found in the past between 7 inches and 3 feet long. They have four toes, which is another distinguishment between them and a regular Bigfoot track. Duke, I don't know who's reporting this or who's seeing this, but I don't want to be them. I don't yeah. want to be that right now. Luckily, it's mostly up in um, Alaska where you get the majority of the reports out of, but I tend to believe that anywhere that there's a really a big enough mountain range and enough isolated wilderness for them to feed themselves, there's a possibility that there's one of them living in that mountain range. And, and, considering you know what, and do you know what's between you, where you are in Montana, and Alaska? Lots Me. of mountain ranges. Me. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't Me. worry. They're, they're east of you. They're over there in that big mountain strip that's uh, between you and the oh, top of Inla. It isn't that. It isn't that far, my friend. <laughs> it isn't that far. Montana, where you are, over to where I am. Sure, you got to go through the Rockies. Then you have to go through the national parks. And guess who's just north of the big national park? Just give a wave. Uh, as you're walking on by, you 30 foot <laughs> hunk that of guy over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, you just know, to let you know, and I was just talking to, to Robert Kreider earlier about this when I was recording him, and we both brought up the subject. Dave Polites doesn't know exactly what's making people miss, disappear. He hypothesizes Bigfoot is responsible for. A lot of it, maybe some of it. And we both think there is Bigfoot that are responsible for some of it. But there are other cryptids out there that are way more aggressive and dangerous than Sasquatch. So keep that in mind when you're wandering around the woods. Maybe the Sasquatch isn't really what you need to worry about. Give us some other creatures. We got 90 seconds. Well, we got Dogman. We got Gugwee. We've got the Janosqua that seemed to be a cross between giants and a big tribe of Bigfoot. And then we've got all of the other paranormal cryptids. Little people, little people make people disappear. Go back and look at legends anywhere on earth where they got legends of the little people. What do they do? They abduct people. And we got more evidence for the little people. We've got their skeletons, Homo floresiensis. They're the hobbit, okay? Those are actually real little people that were three feet tall. We have their skeletons. So how is it that we know that some of these other little people that people are seeing aren't really around? And we've got reports from all over the world about the same weird behavior. Oh, they like to abduct humans. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. You just got to treat them right. Don't mess with nature. Yeah. Don't make the little way. people mad. That's usually, if you think the little people are in your area, you should always figure out from the local natives what the prescribed method for dealing with them is because they vary widely. And some of them are actually like borderline friendly and other ones are unbelievably hostile. But they all seem to be very territorial. So if you go into an area where they're around, you may need to actually like give them a little presence or something to make up for the fact that you were even there so they don't get cranky about it. I never go into the forest without presence, Duke. Never. Yep. It's just, you know what? I It may be real. It may be not, but I'm not taking the chance. It's like buying a warranty on your vehicle. You may never use it, but you feel <laughs> damn good when you got it. Yeah. So we're doing some World Bigfoot Radio on YouTube. Make sure you go hit subscribe. Thank you for another great cryptid report. Coming up next, we got the Dave 101. 
and Turkey Booze News will try and squeeze in the thought of the day as well. We'll be back. Great job, Super Duke. Right on, man. Well, I wasn't reading the script on this one. It's just reports that I've been getting here locally. I can hardly wait to have this guy on the show because he started out from like, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. There's no such thing. And now he's like, yeah, Bigfoot's real. <laughs> I always love when that happens. It took oh, like yeah. six, seven years, but it was totally fun that it, you know. <laughs> that was like when I showed my buddy Mark that, that footprint because he was always like, when I, you know, when I met him, he was always like, yeah, I don't buy into that Bigfoot. I've been hunting 35 years, man. I've never seen anything. And then I took him to the footprint. And it was like, what the hell is this? What the hell is this? Mm -hmm. I don't believe this. What the hell is this? Oh, oh yeah. He just, he had another one not very long ago last fall where he was up in an area that he probably shouldn't have been by himself. And he had a grizzly trail him. And he, you know, you're by yourself. Even if you got a gun, there's a grizzly trail in you. That's bad news. And he had to go down this little slot canyon that got narrower as you go downhill. Big forest on both sides. And he's going, this is the perfect place for that damn bear to ambush me. He's going to get in front of me and pop out at some point and nail me. And he's getting his gun ready. And all of a sudden, he hears this atrociously huge roar from in front of him. It sounds like a T-Rex. Never heard anything like this before. Scared the hell out of him. He said it vibrated his chest. And then he heard something behind him running. And he whirled around. And it was the grizzly who had snuck up, snuck up to about 40 feet behind him. And whenever it was that that thing roared, whatever it was, that grizzly took a hint, turned around, and ran its butt off to get out of there as fast as it could. So then his next question is, what can roar like that and scare a grizzly away? And I said, well, Sasquatch, obviously. And he's like, oh, I don't believe in Sasquatch. <laughs> <clears throat> so now too much overwhelming evidence has been slapping him upside the head, and he's finally having to cave. <laughs> yeah, what throws trees at you, bud? You got grizzlies, boulder grizzlies throwing trees at you? No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. don't. bears don't throw trees at you i can unequivocally state that bears do not throw trees at you that is one of the things they do not do if something's throwing trees at you there's a very short list of what it could be if something is throwing trees at you the only answer is to get the hell out <laughs> well yeah at least they figured that out well after the display and the treetop shaking and all the roaring and they start throwing yeah. trees at us we went eh, maybe we should leave <laughs> Duh. You got that right. But I got to let you go. I got to think of a, a thought of the day here. <laughs> All right, brother. Take care, everybody. We'll see you again next Tuesday. All right. See you, buddy. Take care. Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. Got to love him. All right. Dave's got to put his thinking cap on here for a second. Hmm. What am I going to talk about? <clears throat> Hmm. <clears throat> no, I'm not talking about my gas sovereign farts. <clears throat> Let's see, I have one minute here. What can I think of? Got it. Got it. <clears throat> well, let's see if I can pull this off. <clears throat> Grant Tavius, thanks for that super chat, man. Appreciate that. Loved having you on the show.
We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Space Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. It is that time, once again, where we take a look at my opinion. Yeah, it's all about my opinion here on the Dave 101. Earlier today, I was listening to one of my favorite Sasquatch podcasts called Brunch with Bigfoot with Bigfoot Michigan Rob, who you heard on the show a couple nights ago, and his big furry friend named Tex. Go figure, Tex is from Texas, but he's got a fantastic beard and wears a magnificent cowboy hat and looks just really, really badass. They were talking to Ronald Moorhead about the Sierra Sounds and the fact that there is so much woo starting to go around the Sasquatch world that it is one of those topics that really now needs to be addressed. Now, you have heard me over time talk about Sasquatch and talk about all of the plight and damages we do to the researchers in this field because they believe something different. All right. There's a crew out there who believes they're conducting science when realistically they just don't want to play in the woo. There's the people who call it the monkey, the great ape, the gigantopithecus, and the great North American animal as well. Look, there are many different opinions of what we're looking for. But the big thing is, what do you do if you decide that you want to go out into your local forest and look for the legend? See, I've asked this question many times myself. Dave, what do you do? Well, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I know a lot of people who know a hell of a lot more than I do. And I'll be honest, I piggyback off their words. But here's the one thing that we forget. Think about this. We forget about safety. Safety, yeah. Do you know the animals in your woods? Do you know which animals can harm you and which ones won't? Do you know how to react if you come across a bear or a mountain lion? What do you do? This isn't the city, folks. You just don't go here, kitty, kitty. No, no, you don't. Before you even start looking for Sasquatch, learn your area, learn your route. Always let someone know where you are going. If you don't have a family, if you don't have friends, or your friends are going with you, who do you tell? Call your local police up and say, look, I know this sounds stupid, but I am going out with my buddy or myself or whomever you're with, and we are going to look for Sasquatch in this area. We are going to be gone from this time to this time, and we would appreciate it if we don't call back and check in if you kind of come looking for us, because Sasquatch may have killed us or harmed us or hurt our feelings, and now we're in a safe spot in the forest. That's number one. They'll laugh at you. Sure they will, but it's in good humor. You just take it, and then you check back in. They say thank you. 
it is a great safety net. First and foremost, let somebody know where you're going. Number two, pack for safety. Make sure you have a first aid kit. Make sure you have a flashlight with new batteries and extras. Because if you get into the world of the woo, you know something's going to dim that flashlight pretty darn quick. Number three, bring an extra change of clothes. What happens if you slip, rip, or chip anything on your clothing? And while you're talking about dressing up and getting ready to go look for the Sasquatch, you don't need all full army fatigues to go out in the forest. You don't. Sure, it looks cool. Sure, you blend in with nature. But you know what? You can do it in a pair of jeans. You can do it in comfy sweatpants, a hoodie, whatever. But make sure that you have enough to stay warm. Because if you get stuck out there and you got to sleep in your vehicle, your vehicle still gets cold. And you're going to want something warm. Shoes. What kind of shoes are you wearing to go out in the forest? Me, personally, normally I wear steel-toed boots or hiking shoes. One of the two. Don't go wearing your flip-flops. Don't go wearing your Skechers slip-ons or your best pair of Nikes. All right? Or if you're over the age of 55, your New Balance runners, sneakers in America, that are bright white that you're going to be offended that you got them dirty. Wear proper shoe attire. This is for your safety. One with a thicker sole, just in case there's something sharp sticking out of the ground. Make sure you are prepared for your footwear. Always bring an extra pair of socks. Why? Because in case your feet get wet, you change them. The first way to get cold in nature is to get your feet wet. When your feet are soaked and your feet are wet, that's a sign of a problem. Bring socks. It's true. Moving on. Bring gloves. I don't care if it's the dead of summer. In the forest, it gets cold at night. The temperatures are different than in the city. Make sure you're prepared. Now, what do you bring with you for gear? Bring a recorder with you. So that way, if something roars at night, you can record it. Your phone works for that. It does. What else do you bring for gear? Binoculars. Why? Because maybe you want a close-up of what that tree is or that giant stump is or why is that tree shaking? And you use your binoculars and you see that it's a pack of wild horses and not Sasquatch or a bear scratching its back. Bring sunglasses, something that can protect your eyes. Bring a chainsaw with you because you never know in nature when a tree is going to fall. But most importantly, Bring a GPS. Always have a GPS with you. Know your coordinates. Learn where you are. And if you can't afford a GPS, go down to your local pawn shop and pick up a compass. Learn where the sun is. Okay? Most people, you wouldn't believe how many people out there actually do not know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's real easy to tell northwest, east, and south if you're out there late and to the left of you, the sun is going down. By goodness, if you put money on that in Vegas, that you were looking west, you would win. All right? Learn how to use a chainsaw. If you're in an area where you are allowed guns, pack a gun with you. If you feel safe. Now, up here in Canada, 
We can't carry handguns publicly. No, we're not mature enough for that. But a gun does help if you feel unsafe. Now, many Sasquatch hunters do not use guns, do not bring guns, because they feel that Sasquatch can smell gunpowder. Yeah. I can tell you right now, when I go out and look, I'm not armed. But then again, I can also tell you, if I had my firearms license, I'm not sure if I would go in unarmed. Because we don't know what animals are going to come out. Bring a phone with you. Because even if you get no signal, zero signal, 911 always picks up. For the most part. It will always give you enough signal to get to 911. In most areas. Remember that. That's kind of an important one. And by golly, bring water with you. Bring water. Because you will get thirsty. And you may get dehydrated. And of course, once again, if you get stuck out there, at least you have something to drink. Water is always good. The other thing you want to do is bring bug spray. I don't know about where you guys live, but I can tell you up here where I live in the Caribou of British Columbia, we have two seasons. We have winter and we have bug season. Mm -hmm. Bug season is hell around here. The mosquitoes, very attracted to old Dave. Make sure you have bug spray or some kind of bug deterrent. And you know what? doesn't matter how hot it is. You will wear long sleeves. Wear a baseball cap or a, some sort of hat on your head. Why? Well, number one, if you want to put mesh over your face so the bugs don't land on you, a hat will hold it down. Number two, if it's warm, it'll keep the sun out of your eyes. Number three, ticks. Yes, ticks. Ticks like to find their way from higher elevations like trees and then jump into your hair. And when a tick hits you, you could get Lyme disease. Protect your skin. It's true. It's very true. Now, when looking for Sasquatch, take the 10 minutes that you will need to watch a number of YouTube videos on what you need to cast a footprint. Okay, go down to your local hardware store, costs about 30 bucks for all the gear, and get yourself some molding casts. If it's wet out, like the track is in fresh mud or fresh snow, grab a can of hairspray, because hairspray will actually keep the moisture out you can then pour your casting in and get your cast without any deviations due to the wet mud or snow. Bet you didn't know that. All right, keep a tape measure with you. So that way you can measure things. Bring a notepad so that way you can write things down. Make sure you have a pen or pencil that works. And if you carry pencils, bring the old pencil sharpener. Look, there are many ways that we can do this to go out and have fun in a safe, effective way looking for Sasquatch. And trust me, I say go for it. You don't have to be a well-named researcher. You don't have to be a well-versed outdoors person. But before you do, make sure you're going to be safe. Make sure you know how to take care of yourself in a worst-case scenario because you never know when that worst case scenario is. And when you're in the wild forest, I'm not talking the little park in the back of your house. I'm saying when you are in the wild forest, you never know what you're going to run into and what's going to happen. So always think safety first. Now go on out there once the snow melts and go find your Sasquatch. It'll be a lot of fun. 
Let me know what you think by commenting down below on our YouTube channel. And we say that's it for Dave 101 this week. All right. Here comes Shirky Poo's news. Let's start off with a real cool story. A paralyzed man with a severed spinal cord has been able to walk again thanks to an implant developed by a team of Swiss researchers. It's the first time someone who has a complete cut to their spinal cord that they've been able to walk freely again. The same technology has improved the health of another paralyzed patient to the extent that he has been able to become a father. Yeah, Michael Riccati was paralyzed after a motorcycle accident five years ago. His spinal cord was completely severed. He has no feelings in his legs at all, but he can now walk because of the electrical implant that has been surgically attached to his spine. Someone this injured had never been able to walk like this before. The researchers stress that this isn't a cure for spinal injuries and that the technology is still too complicated to be used in everyday life, but it nonetheless is a major step towards improving the quality of life of people who are paralyzed. Good for them. We need more of that. Let's continue on here on Spaced Out Radio as we go to Idaho, where the Idaho Potato Commission has announced that it is celebrating Valentine's Day and the state signature crop with a limited edition product, potato perfume. Oh, oh, I don't know if it comes in baked, scalloped, mashed, buttered, garlicked, or regular, but I'm excited about this. The IPC said the fragrance, Freaks by Idaho, is made from distilled Idaho potatoes and essential oils and is designed to smell like a fresh plate of French fries. Whether you're at a drive through restaurant or dining in, it's nearly impossible to not grab a fry and take a bite before you dive into your meal. The smell is too good to resist, IPC President and CEO Jamie Hingham said. The perfume is a great gift for anyone who can't refuse a French fry. The commission said the $1.89 bottles of the fragrance sold out quickly on the IPC website, but social media users could still enter an Instagram contest to win free bottles. Let's continue on here. We don't relish telling you this, but it's kind of a big deal. Oh, I hate it when stories have puns like this. Why me? Why me? I'm blaming Shirky Poo for this. Totally blaming Shirky Poo for this one. The Portland Pickles baseball team said their beloved mascot, Dylan T. Pickle, has been stolen, and they are seeking the public's help in bringing him home safely. It all started in the Dominican Republic, where Dylan was making an appearance at a Caribbean baseball series. He was due to return to Oregon via New York City on January 31st. A week later, the team tweeted out some jarring news. An alert message from Delta showing that the bag he was traveling in had been lost somewhere at JFK International. You win one championship this century and think you're too good for storage on an airplane, the Collegiate Summer League teams tweeted to its 29,000 followers. As the days passed, the team put out multiple APBs, which stands for an All Pickles Bulletin, sharing the missing gherkin on posters and calls for help across social media. The team stressed multiple times that the whole thing wasn't just a prank gone sour because, as a member of the media stated, Dylan the Pickle has a reputation for hijinks. Still, team officials are assuring the public that they're not gherkin anyone's chain. Oh, no, that's badly written. We definitely know, are known for being funny and joking around a lot on social media, so we understand the boy who kind of cried wolf scenario, assistant GM Parker Huffman said, but this is definitely not a joke. Dylan's story took a turn on Thursday when the team shared that Delta had found the mascot and delivered him home to their office, but after hours without any notification. Instead of being welcomed back with open arms, Dylan was then snatched 
from the front porch at around 5 a.m. local time and carried away unknown by a damn thief. Oh, this poor pickle. Oh, so now they're out looking for it again. They just want the pickle to be returned. No questions asked. I'm sure they'll get a free baseball hat out of it. All right, moving on. Finally here, a pub purportedly being the oldest in Britain is closing because of financial difficulties 1,229 years after it was established. This is sad. The old Fighting Cox pub in St. Albans, England, announced on Facebook that it was closing permanently after financial problems made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pub's website stated that the business first started pouring drinks in the year 793. Along with my team, I've tried everything to keep the pub going, said manager Christo Tafali. However, the past two years have been unprecedented for the hospitality industry and have defeated all of us who have been trying our hardest to ensure this multi-award winning pub could continue trading into the future. Tafali says the pub's financial problems predated the pandemic, but issues continually worsened until the team determined it was no longer viable as a business operation. Come on, the government's got to do something about that. It's too old to shut down. Thank you, everyone, for listening into the Dave 101. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news. Super Duke for the Cryptid Report. Swamp Dweller for his great spooky stories. And Grant Baker for a night of interesting contact here on Spaced Out Radio. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAV, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. That was solid radio. Solid radio. Good job. Good job, people. Oh. Alley oop. Date and restart. All right. Take these bad boys off. There we go. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Put that in there. Put that in there. Les poissons, les poissons. How I love les poissons! Mm-hmm. That wasn't bad for one minute of preparation, Nicola. I'm not going to lie. One minute of preparation on that one. I'm actually happy with the way that turned out. Not going to lie. Mm-hmm. 
Let's go like that. Close that off. Go here. Do this. Do that. Do this. <coughs> Do that. Check that. Go out of that. Be like, okay, there's that. Close that, close that. Highlight all of this. And affect that. Close down that. Shut down that. Open this. <clears throat> and wait. That's how we roll around here. Giving you the old play-by-play. -play. Hey, no problem, Bigfoot Rob. That was a good show with Ronald Moorhead. You and Tex did a great job today. You really did. Then again, I could listen to Ronald Moorhead for hours. <clears throat> Hi, Mystics Walk. Ted Forquarian. How are you? <coughs> oh, for God's sakes, I'm tired of the goddamn cough. All right, moving forward. Copy, paste, right there. Nice. All right, that one's gone. Go here. Go here. I'll go to here. Let's try that. No, that's going to be there. Copy. Paste. And I trimmed it too short. Damn it. Undo. Undo. <coughs> <coughs> oh, for freak's sakes. Oh. If you guys, uh, when we're done here, if we go over to uh, the Canada's Great Unknown, I'll have a new video up here afterwards. It's kind of cool. Thanks, Merle. Merle! Fuck yeah, Merle. <clears throat> Same as SOR2. I gotta hurry because I don't actually want to do this. Um, there we go. Copy.
That one. Anybody grab that troll yet? Hi, Body Tech. Merle pop in yet? That's better. Now I can breathe. <clears throat> Here we go. Cut. Cut. Copy, paste. Uh, hey, Holly. How you doing? <clears throat> no idea, Major Lee. No idea. Don't follow. Okay, it's got to be somewhere around here in the end. There it is. <clears throat> it's been a while since we had him on, Sonia. <clears throat> God, I feel like I got this frog in my throat right here. <clears throat> fix the problem. Shut down. Nice. <clears throat> All right. 
So we got that out of the way. Don't save. Go here. Go here. Go over to the other channel and go to YouTube. Video. <coughs> All right, uh, let's go here. one up. We all know that up here in northern I'd never have the courage to easy fun it does great un there is My name is Looks good. <clears throat>
Hold on. I can't see what you guys are doing right now. I'm just trying to get this latest uh, <clears throat> story here that Merle has up. That uh, way you guys have something to listen to when I go off air at Canada's Great Unknown. <clears throat> This off to the radio stations. Right. So that holds. <clears throat> Oh, Fab, thank you, buddy. I always love your fantastic foreboding messages. That's always nice. Hey, Fedora John, how are you? English. It's funny, they give you two topics. They give you English and then English Canada. All 
All right, let's launch this one. There we go. The newest, I'll get you a link here. Oh, that's why I still have it unlisted. Public. Done. Save changes. There we go. Let's give a refresh there. There we go. We all know the Canadian wilderness has a diverse amount of wild animals, majestic creatures where some can't be found anywhere else on this planet. Most of Canada's wilderness has remained untouched since the beginning of North America. But does it have its own secrets we don't understand? Creatures that aren't supposed to exist yet people are encountering and reporting to us. On this episode of Canada's Great Unknown, we take a look at some of the strange encounters with legends in our forests. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy these allegedly true stories of cryptids from areas you may know. If you have a story that you would like to share with us, email us at Canada's Great Unknown at gmail.com. We'd also really appreciate you following us on Twitter at CGU Stories, on Instagram and TikTok at Canada's Great Unknown. Also, if you could, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell right here on YouTube so you could follow along every time we post new content to Canada's Great Unknown. Don't forget to leave a comment below these stories and let us know what you think or stories you'd like to hear about. So, thank you tonight to... Uh, let me just turn this off here. Up here in northern British Columbia, where I... Alright, listen to that a bit. A uh, big thank you to Smithy, Horror Realm, Public, uh, Kira, Mitchell, Surf Jair times three with the hat trick, natural hat trick at that, and Grantavius for the great super chats. Really do appreciate you guys. Tomorrow night on the show, who do we got here? Uh, Attila Caldi. We're talking the Australian Yowie. Australian Yowie with Attila Caldi. I'm looking forward to this one. I hope you guys are too. We'll see you tomorrow night, everyone. Sorry I'm not feeling up to par right now, but um, we'll get her going. See you tomorrow.